This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. guys and welcome to another episode of the stardom cast your monthly audio source for all things world wondering stardom right here on the pod mania podcasting network i'm your host rob gooding and i am joined as ever by christopher o'brien chris how are you it's weird when you call me christopher (laughs) <laughs> to be honest as i was going into your full name i was like, i don't think i've ever called him christopher i don't the only people who ever call me christopher uh my mum my dad my brother patrick and then my twin when he's annoyed at me is that your brother Everyone... patrick or is it your brother comma patrick comma is patrick a different person or is patrick your no. brother patrick's my brother okay fair enough i thought you only had one brother no i have <laughs> i have three and a sister okay, now I'm just spawning aren't you <laughs> <laughs> to be fair you don't want to know how many fucking nieces and nephews i have jesus christ to be fair when you say my niece has come round, it is a case of which one yeah to be fair the, the both of the ones I'm, i see on a regular basis are proper little shits <laughs> uh, things only an uncle can say yeah but like one of them walks in and it's like chris you haven't changed your style in the whole time i've been alive and I'm like, you know, shit. when you were young, I spent most of my days in a fucking school uniform. So, like, my style has changed. How old, how old is this niece? Um, she is nine. She's nine. So, in nine years, you haven't changed your style. But, like, to be fair, I don't have an expression. I, I have a timeless style, Rob. I have a band and or wrestling t-shirt. Yep. A, ho- a hoodie, which gets rotated around. If it's cold, I have a bomber. But, you know, for the most part, it's just my hoodie. And jeans. Boom. Timeless. So, you say timeless, I say skater boy. You know, one of the two. <laughs> he was a boy. I knew she was a girl. Start saying that. Also, by the way, Avril Lavigne, genuinely a guilty pleasure of mine. I, I love a bit of Avril. Yeah, I, I'd call it guilty, but, like, I, I'm beyond the... I, I think, like, 1989 by Taylor Swift is, like, an all-time great pop album, so I'm like, I'm beyond feeling guilty about the music I like. Well, you say 1989 by Taylor Swift. Now, in all honesty, I've never heard the actual full album by Taylor Swift. What I have mm-hmm. heard is the Ryan Adams cover, which he released, which is basically he's just done an album of all of the songs from 1989. And his cover of Bad Blood his cover of Blank Space and of Shake It Off are all absolute bangers. And I I implore everyone that listens to this, uh, if you love a lovely lovely bit of acoustic acoustic uh, melancholy, then uh, go and check out Ryan Adams' covers of Taylor Swift. They are bangers. It is a bit weird to me that you've listened to that, but not the original album. <laughs> I haven't got anything against Taylor Swift. I, I appreciate that she can write some tunes. Um... She's just not my. Some, I, I can't some have box. my phone on shuffle and have corn come on and then followed instantly by Taylor Swift. I just there's a little bit of me oh. that just can't have that happen. I I deliberately make my shuffle as like varied as possible. So I'm like like so if I'm sitting on the bus listening to music or just you know in my dark room crying, I can have. <laughs> um... In which case, corn <laughs> would be perfect. No, but like um, it nobody goes, understands it, me. Like, the other night I went for my walk, and on my, sh- on my shuffle... So, like, I've been listening to, like, fa- uh, like classic albums recently, but when they finish, I, I just go into shuffle, and I went from, like, Metallica to The Greatest Showman to Taylor Swift to Idol to, like, a hardcore punk band to The Beatles. And I was like, ah, I love my shuffle. <laughs> um, what album are you on uh, of your 1,001 um, albums you must listen to right now that you're trying to work your way towards? I've listened to five or six. I can't remember. <laughs> um, and I'm not going like in order. I'm just like randomly picking. Okay. Right. Okay. Cause, so- no, because I went in order. <laughs> if I went in order, do you realize how many fucking Frank Sinatra albums I would have to fucking listen to? Hey, 
You do, you say not one bad word against the crooner that is Frank Sinatra. You leave that man alone. Oh, like because I end because I don't mind Elvis. I quite like Elvis actually. But um, I, if I had to listen to um Elvis Presley, te- um eight times in ten albums, <laughs> never again. Never okay. fucking again. No, that that's that's reasonable. I mean, whoever compiled that list, putting that much Elvis in that small I, confined I'm ex- space is ridiculous. I am exaggerating, but like you have to like the amount, especially like in the early days, people they would like commit to a vinyl album. It's probably not that long a list because it probably wasn't the easiest thing to produce. So. No, no, I get that. Um, just off the cuff, if you had to have one album. And I know it's going to be a Smiths album. If you had one album on vinyl, what would oh, it be? Easy. Revolver by the Beatles. Favourite album. It is a very, very good album. It's, um, it's, my, it's the album that I listen to and it's like, oh shit, music can be more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's like when you've got a record player and you're listening to vinyls, you, you have got to pick albums that you can listen to all the way through. And um, mm-hmm. the, the mass, there's two big one they're both pink floyd arms actually um dark side of the moon which is just oh it's just musical masterpiece and wish you were here which is probably top three favorite albums ever alongside led zeppelin 4 and uh, dark side of the moon a- absolutely cracking albums i know my three favorite albums just off the top of my head it's the beatles um revolver the strokes is just it and definitely made me by oasis Three strong albums. I'm not a massive Strokes fan, but I can I can appreciate that. Um, yeah, I don't know why we're stalling for time, by the way, Chris. Because we're, 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 t- we're not even stalling for we're not even stalling for time. We just got talking. <laughs> we, just... we have we haven't done the starting cast in like a month of this. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do the last one on my own, and I'm just happy to have someone else here <laughs> just to bounce off. Um, no, I, I do need to uh, apologise to everyone. Um, I've not been in a great place recently, and Chris stepped in to do um, the last Stardom cast on his own, which is always horrible uh, to do a podcast on your own because you've got, like we said, you've got no one to bounce off. You just get empty silence on the other end, which is never nice. So thank you for that, Chris. Um, at, l- at least twice during it, I was like, well, what do you think? It's like, oh, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> I miss him so much. Yeah, I, I have to I edit it out. So, like... <laughs> No, because like remember when I had to do the fucking Young Lion on my own? Like it got like more listens than it did with the two of us because New Japan was hotter at the time. But I, it was shite. It was really <laughs> shite. <laughs> oh, anyway, let's let's start at least heading towards what we're supposed to talk about today. Um, obviously because um I've been pretty missing in action recently on the Stardom Cast. We have got four shows. Uh, to go through for you tonight um a couple of which we are probably going to skim over and give you the the edited highlights and our thoughts on some of the main storylines um but obviously we're going to be going through the Corican show the five star special at Corican from the 28th of September good god September feels like a long time away and um the Yokohama Cinderella show from the 3rd of October um before we do go into that though um just quickly, we're not going to be talking about the Goddesses of Stardom Tag League shows. Uh, we'll be talking about it a little bit at the end of the podcast, but we won't be reviewing the shows simply because they aren't up in their entirety yet because lol, Stardom World. Um, so what we will do is on Sunday, I promise this time, there'll be no Rob reasons, I promise I'll be here on Sunday, uh, we'll be reviewing those first two Goddesses of Stardom Tag League shows. Um, and then fingers crossed we are going to attempt hopefully this goes down well with the uh with the community but we're going to try and make this podcast a weekly thing um simply because if we leave it monthly at the rate that stardom is pumping out shows there is just simply too much to talk about in one show if we only do it um, and um, you know once a month so we're going to try and do it weekly uh, of course this obviously um, completely depends on Stardom's upload times um, because obviously this Sunday on the 17th um, there is another Corrigan show which won't be up in time for us to actually review it so we'll have to do that the following week um, but yeah let us know if us doing this weekly to twats talking about Stardom if that's what you want to hear on a weekly basis um, so yeah that's that's what we're going to do so we're not going to review those two 
shows. We'll be doing that next week. However, something we are going to talk about is something from all the way back, Chris, on the 22nd of September, which, good God, how long ago does that feel? Um, We're talking, of course, about the Five Star Grand Prix special show in Osaka um, from the Edian Arena at Osaka, number two, in front of 294 people. Um, So just whizzing through the... Two opening matches. In match one, Azumi defeated Natsu Samir at 7 minutes and 24 seconds with the Azumi Sushi. And then in match two, Death Yamasan and Konami defeated Riho and Saya Ida at 8 minutes and 7 seconds with the O'Connor roll. Match three then saw Jungle, Kiona and Himika go to a 20-minute time <laughs> limit draw. Now... Um, sorry, not a 20-minute time limit draw, 15-minute time limit draw. Um, now, Chris, I am fully aware that this match has one of your bugbears, and there's a very, very high chance that you are going to rant about it. So before you do, and you have every right to, um, I just want to say the glaring thing that we're going to talk about aside, this was a very, very, very good match. This was a good match, yeah. Um, Himika was surprisingly fast. I don't, you don't really know if I'm being fast to even prove a five star, but she got to a jungle. Who you keep forgetting how big she is for, um, how fast she is rather than how big she is. So, yeah, like the match itself, I have no real issues with. It's probably a high seven, verging on a low eight, which is really good for one of these um, minor shows. But two things. One, this had no booking reason to exist, and that is shown because B was a time limit draw for no fucking reason because you didn't want either person to lose, but also you didn't want um, you wanted both of them on the show, and you couldn't apparently have put them anywhere else on the show, so they're here because why not? I agree. I agree. well, I agree on both counts. Um, the time limit draw, I do sort of understand. Um, because obviously you've got Jungle Kiona especially, who was going on to far bigger things at Corican and then again at Yokohama. Um, with Himika, you know, she's just come out of the five-star, off a really, really good five-star. She's going into the Yokohama show looking for the tag titles. So I understand the need to keep both women strong. However... Yeah, but don't book for match, man. <laughs> exactly. If you want to keep both people strong, don't pit them against each other. I mean, would it have made so little sense to have Jungle take on one of Oida Tai one-on-one. You know, one of the one of the underlings. Why not Saki? Why not have a tag team match rather than the six-woman tag that followed it? And why not have Jungle versus Saki in a one-on-one match and have Himika take on someone else, have them both have wins? Well, you've been throwing Rio with random people, right? So just put... Um... <laughs> Real with jungle or something like there's so you could have reorganized this card so easily and it has no reason to exist apart from we needed something big on this show despite the fact there was a title match on this show which was actually pretty good but yeah like i don't know but the booking the, like the more thought about it the less booking sense this made and like i'm not one for big matches for big matches sake it's so, sort of why i tuned out of nxt when it went to the telly so mm-hmm. um I, I do agree with you, and I think like your thoughts are completely validated. I think your thoughts are slightly exacerbated by the fact that it was yet another time limit draw, and stardom seemed to be spamming that a little bit mm-hmm. in their booking. We seem to have witnessed a lot of time limit draws recently. Um, like, rem- remember when uh, stardom is again, but Queen's Quest of a War went to a... Um, I had a story reason to exist, went to a draw... Everyone looked good, and it was like, cool. Great little way to start off sad and well done. And then there was that triple threat, which went to a draw, which kind of made no sense, but, you know, fine. And then that Queen's Quest versus Donna Del Mondo thing went to a draw, because, okay. And then the five-star happened, and it was like, draw, 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 draw. And then as soon as we enter, uh, go out with that five-star, spoilers, there's two fucking draws. They're not shocking yeah. anymore. Like I'm thinking about like other promotions, um, and for example, Noah has had like maybe the same amount of draws as Stardom had, but they spread them out through the year 
So at least for either shocking or necessary to have either been in like a tournament setting or in like the double title match or like when it was um, Suzuki taking on Nakajima or like All Japan off the top of my head, they've had two. It was Yoshida versus Namora, which worked because both were, fe- um, were feuding, but both needed to not lose. So that makes sense. And then um that six man which is basically just a don't worry we'll be back after corona so and like now start and when something goes to a draw i'm just like again it's not a shock i think the problem is you've just said noah have done the you know roughly the same mad draws but they spread them yeah, out over not... the year yeah. that's the problem we've had so many time limit draws condensed into maybe the last three or four months and you know mm-hmm. we just again if this if we hadn't have had so many draws before this, it would have been a you know I wouldn't have looked on it so so negatively. The the time limit draw, I mean, not the match. Again, the match is great, and I want to talk about a couple of bits of the match in a minute. But again, we didn't need one here. You know, have them go fourteen minutes and just have someone win because ultimately Jungle needed to win more than Himika did here. Um, and if again, like you said before, you can just reshuffle the card. There was only five matches on this card, and I understand they've got times to go, but, you know, just have a little rejig. There's no need to have yet another time limit draw. And I understand the attraction of having Jungle versus Himika because that is a very, you know, a powerful match. You consider, obviously, how well Himika did in the five-star. You consider what Jungle's got going on at this time. It's a drawing match. I just, I feel like it didn't need to go to yet another draw. Um, However, let's move away from that. Um, I want to go back to something you said about Himika. We're continuing to develop Himika as more than just the behemoth bodyguard. Uh, there was an there was such a lovely moment when um, Jungle went for the sliding lariat, and Himika seamlessly arm dragged away out of it. And it's just it's not something you expect from someone of Himika's size. She was so quick and nimble on her feet, and you put it perfectly. She she kept up. With Jungle, and even when Jungle was working Himika's back, Himika was selling it brilliantly. She couldn't get Jungle off the top rope. She continued to sell. Um, also, Jungle getting Himika into the Jungle Buster position, absolutely class. Love that. Mm-hmm. And it was perfectly timed as well. It really, but really was. Trouble. Really was. Um, I did give it an 8, I'll be honest, because... Finish aside... That's not the wrestler's fault. The match was wrestled at a great pace. It held my interest. There was little story beats. Um, Both women looked strong. And it had a really, really good closing stretch. I think it did deserve the eight in the end. Yeah, it's verging on an eight for me. I don't know. I think, honestly, the booking thing is holding it back. And I know it's not the wrestler's fault. But external factors do play into wrestling matches more than really any other mm. medium. Like when you're watching a Marvel movie, unless you're doing what I've been doing and watching them all in sequence, you don't notice that there's a fake out death. Every fucking Marvel movie. But <laughs> um no no, seriously. Seriously, fuck's sake, I hate it. From like Captain America to Guardians of the Galaxy, all of them have fucking fake out it's awful. Anyway, um but like here because we are watching it sequentially and also like because it's Japanese promotion several times weekly, mm. this stacks up. This stacks up really fast, and they've used the draw card too many times. We cannot use this draw card for the rest of the year. No, and I've got a horrible feeling they probably are going to. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like we want to. It's like we want everyone to put on like thirty minute classics, and then forgot they put a time limit in place. Yeah, I mean the crowd are really into this. Let's. Um... Let's not be oh, around the bush with that. Internet. Yeah, massively. Really good crowd reaction. There was actually throughout all of these shows, um, especially for Yokohama. Yokohama had a really, really, really good crowd. Um, we move on then. Match four um, saw the Oida Tag team of B Priestley, Saki Kashima, and Natsuki Tora defeat the Queen's Quest team of Momo, um, Momo Watanabe, Yutami, and Sayaka at 13 minutes and 28 seconds with the Kamagoye. And then match five, the main event, was the Artist of Stardom title match with the DDM team and the champions of Juliet, Micah, and Suri 
defending and retaining against the Stars team of Mayweather, Starlight Kid, and Tam Nakano. Though, let's face it, Chris, the titles were very, very much secondary in this match. Yeah, this was, with the exception of Starlight and um, Mike, all oh, this was here to just set up, set up Shiri and Mayu and Julia and Tam. I continue to love um, Tam and Julia's um, dynamic, which is a, almost a rehash of um, Julia and Hannah's dynamic in that, like, they just want to. We just don't like each other, do we? It's very similar. No, I I got that, especially in the tag match um, at Corican. Mm-hmm. I got that vibe definitely. Did you see the promo that Tam cut on Julia after their five star match? Um, did I can't remember. I can't remember which one was that. Um, it was second to last day of a five star, and then afterwards, um, when Tam won, she was like, "Julia, you are trash." <laughs> You are trash that floats to you. You are trash that floats through space. You are space trash. <laughs> she, I love her. She's great. Absolutely great. No one else can get away with cutting a promo like that. Imagine if, like, um, I don't know, Akada, if he wanted to decide to do something good nowadays, mm. picked up a mic and went to your trash. This match. It made me remember why Tam versus Julia is the most hype feud in stardom at the moment. And considering we went into this match with the Mayu versus Suri build relatively cold, um, in fact, I'll be honest, completely cold, um, I thought they did a very, very good job over these over these two matches, this and the main event of Corican, they did a fantastic job of hyping it because, oh my God, the chemistry those two have is unreal. Yeah, um, it's almost too good to be... I think it's not quite as good as um, the chemistry Shiri and Momo would have. I'm kind of still sad that that match got cancelled for obvious reasons, but, you know, I'm so sad about it. Um, but yeah, just... But we know that these people mix because we've been in tag matches before. But like when they were sort of the vocal point of this match, it was even better and just really strong stuff from this whole match. Um, Starlight's also getting better. Um, it, it's something we can bring up more at Yokohama. But mm. like she's actually starting to hit her moves with some form of power. Which yeah. was my biggest problem coming into Starlight this year. And also Micah she started doing this thing and it's it's not some of it suits her and she needs to stop. She keeps trying to wrestle like a power wrestler and she's not big enough. I like think it's she something her... she'll grow into. I think uh, I do Maybe, see your point, but, but it, it didn't really bother me. I'll be honest. I think the problem is she started trying to do that in like her last few five star matches, which were against Utami and Jungle. And it's like, why are you trying to be a power wrestler against Utami and Jung of all people? <laughs> yeah, you're not going to win in a fight with Utami in that regard, it's like are you? If, it's like if you're trying to get over, like, I am the best technical wrestler in the world, no one can outgrapple me, and then you try to debut that character against Zack Sabre Jr. It's just not going to work. <laughs> um, they did a fantastic job of building Suri here. Um, as a, just a real fucking menace. There was, this, there was a great moment. It was my moment of the night um, when... Starlight Kid goes for the Kishan Bomb on Julia. So she sat on Julia's back and Suri just walks in, buzzsaw kicks Starlight Kid off of Julia across the ring. It was what, it was beautiful. What kind of like how nonchalantly she was. <laughs> she did. It was proper like, she might as well have been whistling as she strolled up to poor Starlight and then punted <laughs> her across the ring. She's just going up and in her head. No chains, <laughs> It was brilliant. Um, Julie, by the way, low key one of the best Hammerlock DDTs I've seen. It is a pretty good. She she's pretty good at it. She gets it in there naturally, which is something people have struggled with. Tessa Blanchard struggled with that when she started using it. Yeah, she did. She did. Um, but, but again, she also struggled with not being racist. So. <laughs> yeah, struggled with not being a dick. Um, but yeah, overall, I love this match. The chemistry that all six women had, and again, I'm going to say it again. I think Julia over the three nights or the four nights, if we're counting Nagoya, was she she is so improved from when we Mm -hmm. first started this podcast. And yeah, there are little bits that still gripe me a little bit, 
but how much she has grown into this role, how much she's grown into just this arrogant dickhead, which she was with Starlight Kid, especially towards the start of the match, just this arrogant disdain she got for this person, and how well, just, I'm just going to ruin it now, because her match with Tam at Yokohama is a bona fide match of the year candidate, and I just loved it, and I think when she's got someone she's got this chemistry with, she's capable of putting on these absolute classics, and I can't wait to see what she does with people later on in this year because at the moment she is on fire. Um, I was there my thoughts on Julia for the Yokohama. I'm trying to like not give away all my thoughts. And effort. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what did you give this uh, match then, Chris? Um, I gave it like a mid to high seven. I, I, as a match, it's not as good as Jungle versus Himika. It, it's almost like your standard. B show main event just with a title on the line. Yeah, fair enough. I think I think in terms of that and also in terms of like a setup for Yokohama, the match on the Corican show was much yeah. better. No, I agree. I agree with that. So with that being said, let's move on then to our second show, which was the five star special in Corican from the twenty eighth of September, uh from Corican Hall in front of four hundred and seven people uh we open the show with rio defeating hannon at five minutes and 11 seconds with the crossface to be perfectly honest it was a pretty run of the mill match for rio to but sort of know. was but there like for rio's meant to be like this big like outside a draw and for someone who's like this big outside a draw they're doing a whole lot of nothing with her. they yeah there doesn't seem to be a lot of program at the moment for rio she just seems to be <laughs> stuck with random people in tags or doing nothing think, single matches I'm, I'm kind of fine with that i'm kind of I, I've, I have my gripes with rio and they've not kind of went away so i'm kind of fine with her just being enough in nothing mid card and openers so no that's fair enough hannon look good um her submission game's really strong but again high angle cross face for the win i gave it four stars it's it's not one you need to go out of your way to watch at all um Really sad next as Itsuki Hashino has to announce her immediate retirement from in ring competition. Um, she was supposed She's to going have to time, wasn't she? Yeah, she was supposed to have a final match at Corican that night, uh, but unfortunately she had to cancel it due to illness. She says that she's been having treatment for an unexplained physical condition. There was a chance for recovery, but apparently not anymore. Um, in fact, saying it will only get worse if she carries on wrestling. Uh, Rossi Ogawa then made a presentation, and that was it. What a horrible way to go out. It's a real shame, isn't it? Because um, she was in the class with the size, wasn't she? Yes. And you never you never really got to see much potential from her, not just because the two sides are so, like, they're so, such naturals that she kind of just fell into the background. I think as well, she struggled especially recently she struggled so much with yeah injury injury um it's such a shame like not even to be able to get her planned final match it it's heartbreaking for her and our heart goes out to her so hopefully she manages to make a go of something and does well in whatever she does in the future um match 2 then we had B Priestley defeating Saya Kamatani at 9 minutes and 32 seconds with plan B chris your opinion and mm-hmm. Are you a fan of the returning B Priestley, and does it change Oida Tai's dynamic for you? Um, Oida Tai has someone who's actually finishing matches, so <laughs> it's an instantly an improvement on Tora. Instantly, <laughs> instantly. <laughs> um, I was I found because she's for Plan B is for Regal Plax, and I was like, huh, she's not eating the um, Queen's Landing, so. Maybe she's changing it up because for Queen's Landing, at least for her, cause she's not big either. She's not all that tall. And I've, I might be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure Manami Tail was quite tall. So, like, when she did it, it made more sense. But when B does it, it's just sort of a bit awkward. Mm. But so I was like, this is a bit better. But then she used it in the Momo match. So, well, I <laughs> quite like that. I quite like that. Like, you know, when I, you've I like got the secondary that... finishes. Yeah, exactly. You need to pull out that. Finish. I mean, I can't even mm. remember the last time King... Momo finished someone with the Peach Sunrise. Oh, yeah, the Peach Sunrise hasn't been used for ages, has it? <laughs> I mean, I can't... someone's going to say on the Discord now about she finished someone with it in the five star, but I don't think yeah, she did. That, that, that all blends together, though. It, I mean, she, she um... probably did. So if, 
if she did i yeah. apologize but the thing is she isn't overusing it every match yeah she's like mostly using like b drivers and meteors right now yeah but yeah this match this match was fine nothing offensive sires works well with babyface fire she's still a bit ropey on the selling but b Priestley doesn't tend to do limb matches so she was fine here yeah. um yeah I'm, I'm fine with her being back i'm just fine with stardom's roster being a bit more filled out now that the um not the pandemic's ending but now that it's, re- restrictions in japan are a bit less to, so that should be fun i look i'm more looking forward to hater being back than having b back to be completely honest but i'm, I'm fine with b being back yeah i mean the i thought these two had pretty decent chemistry Com- going on piggybacking on the what and um, what you said it wasn't a limb match so size lack of selling didn't bother me um there was quite a few story threads running through this. Of course, you've got B's betrayal of Queen's Quest. And then, of course, you've got Sire and Utami winning the tag belts when B and Jamie had to vacate them. So you've got little story threads going through, just a little bit of fight, you know, something that helps that storyline burn. Um, there was one thing I'm really excited about with B being back. What's that? And that's um, B Priestley sweary promos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are good. Though it did make me laugh when she was just like, Sire, your crap. Momo, your crapper. And it was like, oh my god. <laughs> I hear Do stuff you, like that on uh, the playground. My favourite thing um, from her this year um, was at No People Gate after um, Sire came out to go, I'm going to team with Utami. And she was like, um, Utami, you are a loser. And because t- she so desperately wants to be Japanese. And she's like, I'm teaming with some Gopa young girl. It's not going to fucking change that. <laughs> Um, she was never in danger of losing this match ever. Bless Saya, but she she was never, never going to lose this match, especially as we were setting up the match with Momo for the SWA Championship. Um, yeah, overall, I thought they had really good chemistry. I gave it high six, low seven. Um, again, I'm feeling nothing. Offensive. I'm feeling mid six on this one. Mid six, okay, Chris. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not in the mood to fight you today, mate. I'm really not. But, but like, mid six is in line with your ratings. (laughs) It's literally, I I wasn't a fight, I was agreeing with you. (laughs) Anyway, uh, match three, tag team match, saw the DDM team of Micah and Himika defeat Starlight Kid and Saya either at nine minutes and 59 seconds with the anchor Atoshi. Um, really good way of getting Himika and Micah heated up ready for their tag team championship match. Chris, what did you think? Um, this is fine. Um, nothing, nothing bad, nothing amazing. But yeah, it's a, it's a basically a warm up match for the team of Micah and Himika. You have decent chemistry. Good big man versus little thing man thing. Apart from Micah keeps trying to do fucking power moves. Um, to be fair, she can do that against Sayreeder and Starlight. Uh, Oh yeah, because they're approximately three foot two. Yeah. I've, I've eaten me- I've eaten meals bigger than Sirena and Sal Kid. Bless him. But um They could absolutely break us both in half. <laughs> oh but they could they could break us both in half. Oh Christ, I, I sometimes live in fear of Sirena chops, but <laughs> But yeah, nothing there's nothing really to talk about other than like it's a good little um condensed showcase for um the DDM team going into their title match, which again is another one they're going into a bit cold. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, Starlight Kid, there was a lovely moment when Micah goes for this big vertical suplex and Starlight counters it into an absolutely mental DDT. It looked it looked mm-hmm. really, really good and she broke it out um, at Yokohama as well. Um, awesome RBD shit. It was, it was amazing. And also, since when does Saya have a sit-out spine buster? Fucking love that shit. Break that out more. Yeah, to be fair, both her, both the sides are at the point of their game where they're adding new moves every match, just because they're at that stage of their career where they're just sort of like they've got the fundamentals apart from selling. <gasps> and... Oh my god, I've just remembered the move that Saya Kamatani's put into hers. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, well, we will get to that. Oh my god, um... <laughs> so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the most part of this match, it's like the previous match, it's a good um, preview going into the Yokohama show, but nothing needs to go out your way for. No, no, fair enough. Um, so we then move on to match four, which was the captain's four uh. match. I know. <laughs> uh, Tokyo Cyber Squad defeating Oida Tai via DQ at 12 minutes and 10 seconds. Before you rank, Chris, 
Um, the rules were that the match can end in two ways. You can either pin the opposition's team captain, um, which bizarrely is announced as Natsu Samir, um, or you can defeat both the other two team members. So obviously you've got the team of Konami, Jungle, and Death. So if you don't pin the captain, you have got to pin both Konami and Death Yamasan, um, or just Jungle. Whichever way you go, uh, whichever way you go about I'm pretty, it, I'm pretty sure that's the Lucha thing. I'm not overly familiar with it, um, but it, you know, it worked. I didn't hate it. Um, not I the concept it anyway. A, I remember it being a thing in SmackDown vs. Raw 2006. Yeah, Chris, <laughs> explain yeah. the decision to have Natsu Samir as captain. Um, you want, you want okay, so. Here's my thinking. Um, Natsu Samir uh-huh. doesn't like doesn't like going into the ring. So <laughs> if she's not in the ring, can't she can't it. be pinned. <laughs> yeah, do, do you know what? Fair enough. Fair enough. Because I thought with Natsu being announced as captain, because everyone expected it to be Tora, and I'm sure that Tokyo Cyber Squad expected it to be Tora as well, and sort of that was the big the big sort of ruse from Ruida Tai, but it didn't even play into the fucking finish because shock <laughs> of the pissing day, we get another DQ. Now, I understand completely that this was then going to um, sort of go over into the Yokohama show um, for the bigger match, um, which sort of begs the question why the fuck we had this match here to end in DQ. Um, I am going to let it slide. Think- I am going to let it slide partly because of what happens after the match um but yeah it's it was very very unnecessary this match i think i think they wanted to set up the yokohama show the best way to do it was um in the lead up to um you know that six man at um ecw not barely legal what's the one we watched um heat wave yeah what you needed to do, and like in the lead up to that, they had like a three person, um, three matches with a three people with the six people involved, and then they got to deserve a stipulation. I think someone like that would have been a much better way rather than like, okay, we're gonna have the match, but not really because <laughs> mm. you know, Tora be Tora and throw out the ring. Of course, of course, someone like that, it's just stupid and I hate it. <laughs> what I don't, I'm so done. Oh no. I'm so done with Tora. I'm so done with it. What I don't understand is... Now, I understand... Okay, let's let's assume for a moment. I understand that we need to get to Yokohama. That's our big show. We need, so, we need this big angle going into Yokohama. Fine, completely understand that. From a kayfabe point of view, Aweda Tai are setting out to destroy Tokyo Cyber Squad. That's been their MO. That's what this match is set up about. And I know that it was Jungle who sort of announced this match, but why on earth, if you're a Weed Attire, would you get yourself disqualified, which would then hand them the win and not be asked about it one bit? I, I don't understand that. I understand the need I to think... get it to Yokohama, but I don't understand the fact that Tora then deliberately got herself DQ'd so that Tokyo Cyber Squad won. I just, I don't understand I... that. I think the, well, like in a uh, wider term, it's because the storyline went on longer than we expected it to. Um, but in kayfabe, I guess like Tora knows that Jungle will get mad and up the stakes to something that um, where um, have Jungle up the stakes to something where Oedetai are more likely to win because they don't seem more likely to win an actual six man setting. Mm. You know, despite the fact they have a win over the six <laughs> six person championship, I just I, but, yeah. <laughs> it's a, I just I literally just think it's because this was meant to be over up when the Yokohama was meant to take place what two months ago, and yeah. it didn't. So I think that's literally just it. I mean, it was saved slightly by the impassioned speech from Jungle, who then challenges Oida Tai to another match, saying this time it's going to be no DQ. Both units' futures being on the line. The idea of Jungle being just possessed and just this complete desperation to prove herself and just 
wildly without thought, putting stuff on the line. It it adds a great wrinkle to the story. Um, the fact that she's driven wildly by her emotions, I, I do enjoy that. And that's why I'm not shitting all over this match because ultimately it's a means to an end. Ultimately, I just the DQ element didn't really make sense from an Oida Tai point of view. But then again, what does make sense from the Oida Tai point of view? I did enjoy that the only person who got a pinfall for Tokyo Cyber Squad was Death. <laughs> <laughs> she needs to look strong. She needs to look strong. She's got... <laughs> Keep Death strong. If you're, if you're gonna debut someone against <laughs> Death, you Death needs to look strong. Former high speed champion. <laughs> Um, overall, I, I gave this a five. I don't think there's, you know, it, it was there. It was a means to an end. This entire thing was done with having Jungle announce that no DQ match at Yokohama. I think that was the whole point. So I'm not going to shit on it. I'm just going to yeah, give it five. I, I completely agree, yeah. So then we move on then to a six-woman tag team match with the marvellous team of Mei Hoshizuki and Neutra, which is Rin Kadokura and Takumi Ihora. I'm really sorry if I've mispronounced any of those names. Defeating the Queen's Quest team of Azumi, Momo Watanabe and Yutami Haishishita in 20 minutes and 36 seconds with the backslide reversal. This match fucking slapped. Oh, this fucked. This fucked so hard. Um, first of all, when we say marvelous team, we mean like that's where they're from, not like they were a marvelous team. <laughs> um, but um, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to describe people in terms of attire because I'm so bad with new names. Okay, but I'll just tell with you the that exception of a horror. Hoshizuki is the high speed mm-hmm. one. Oh, the one in like the tie dye. Yeah, the one who challenged, the one who basically went one on one with Azumi, and then Kadokura is the one that yeah. pretty much was just non-existent. <laughs> she just didn't exist because for, at some point, um, <laughs> Shiki was just <laughs> drop kick. Drop that kick. drop kick barrage drop was kick. absolutely fucking brilliant. I was just right going, okay, it's over. Nope. Is that, you know when like you're crossing gonna cross a somewhat busy road? Is like you're gonna stop to let me throw? Um, <laughs> no. Are you gonna stop? No. Are you gonna stop? No. <laughs> Are you converting Hashizuki's offense to a motorway? No, a mo- I don't cross a motorway after the accident. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm so glad the horror hit. Like a horror, every time she was like t- she was taken down a few times of this match, and every time she did, it was felt like um, Queen's Quest had conquered a beast. Like, it yeah. was insane how, like, stronger horror was. By the way, her kicks, ouch, ouch, ow. I, I, some say you can still hear the fucking kicks. <laughs> like, it's not even that. It's the fucking speed she does him with, with as well. Because you see her and she's around him at his side. And it's like, you're not going to move fast. And then she can't, when you can't see her feet when she's kicking, it's like, what? How? She's deceptively quick. In the same way we talked about Himika, but this was this was even quicker. And this is no mm. disrespect to Karakura or Hoshizuki. I thought they were great. Um, but Irora was just a completely different level. The chemistry she had mm-hmm. with all three of Queen's Quest, even, you know, Azumi, who is, you know, the less experienced, if you will, or, you know, the high speed person as opposed to I don't want to use the word heavyweight, but you you understand what I mean. Her strikes with Momo were everything I wanted them to be and more. Her stuff with Utami was amazing. And I would love to see a singles match between Aura and any of these three Queen's Quest women because honestly, it was absolutely incredible. Her striking, her selling, she felt like a star in the ring. She really did. But she felt like she, the main person in this match. She also, she also has like a very striking, like, like this. I always, when I say someone has a striking look, you just imagine if you saw them walking down. Like, for example, imagine if you saw um, Sonada with his hair walking down the street, <laughs> or um, Kento Miyahara being the most beautiful man in the world walking down the street. Um, but imagine if you saw Takumi Horror walking down the street. It's like this giant with like she, and like in terms of looks, she reminds me of Bill Nakano, just in terms of she's just the coolest thing in the ring. Yeah, absolutely. She draws your eye. You can't help but yeah. watch it. And I was I was physically waiting for her to come into the ring. Um, and again, that's no disrespect to the other women on the Marvelous team. I just she she carried herself in such a way. 
it, it was amazing. And then, obviously, the stuff with Hoshizuki and Azumi was absolutely brilliant as well. That flash pin closing stretch, breathtakingly quick. Loved it. And then, ultimately, quite bizarrely, I thought, when you consider who's in the ring, it was actually Hoshizuki who got the pinfall win over Azumi, um, which we assume... Her brother. Her brother, though, as well. Yeah, exactly. She was... So I think that's what we're trying to do because we're both part of that um, alliance thing. So I think we're just trying to book a wee angle. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I am all for that Hashizuki versus Azumi match. And Mm -hmm. post-match, Irora pleads with Utami to let her cut the queue to challenge for the red belt, um, meaning there's a possibility of Mayu versus Irora 2, Electric Boogaloo. Um, Utami clearly wants to see that as well because Utami's like... Yeah, all right. Um, I'll just take on the winner. Um, and then Azumi asks for Hosh- uh, asks Hoshizuki for a match, uh, which she sort of accepts, whilst asking Azumi if she wants to be a tag team, which Azumi sort of accepts. And then that's it. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I um, like he, they might as well have handed each other a note. It's like, do you want to be my tag team partner? <laughs> yes. Oh no. Yeah. Very very indecisive. Um, but what a match. Just go, this is one I do encourage you to go out of your way. These last two matches, go and watch them. This is great. Anyone that is a complete marvelous novice like myself, this is the first time I've seen Aurora because I still haven't seen that match from February. However, I am going to go and watch that this week. Um, this was a really, really good introduction, a really, really good match. Um, loved it. Gave it nine. I gave it nine as well. And can't really think of a six man this year that I've liked more. No, I don't think there is one. Like in terms of like just wrestling as a whole, not just stardom, because in stardom this is very this is like top ten of the year overall in stardom. Pummy. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. Like, in terms, absolutely. But in terms but in terms of like an actual six man that I liked more I was about to say Stadium Stampede, but that wasn't a six man. No, it was definitely a ten man. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. I yeah, I don't yeah, so it's probably my favourite six man um, tag match of the year, so yeah, and I, I love a good six man. <laughs> um, so then we moved on to the main event, um, which saw Mayu and Tam Nakano, Tam Nakano, Tam Nakano, um, <laughs> Tam Nakano. Who the fuck's that? <laughs> oh god, <laughs> I'm not even drunk. Um, and Julia and Shuri go to a 30 minute time limit draw. Now, Chris, what we just spoke about with the time limit draw, this makes sense this does make sense but the issue, but again the issue is in like i i find it hard to watch matches in a bubble and within the context that took place there's been so fucking many i took myself out of that simply because a draw made sense here I, it didn't make sense on the previous show it didn't it doesn't make sense for quite mm. a few matches we've seen that have got to time limit draws however here i think it did it did everything it needed to. From Mayu being unnaturally subdued during a pre-match promo, um, expressing just just that one moment in that pre-match promo where Mayu turns to Tam and says, I'm nervous, I'm anxious because of Shuri's kicks. Shuri is instantly put over as a credible threat. Yeah, like straight away. <laughs> this. Yeah, it's it's a perfect way to get him over, especially going to the match, which, as we said, was a bit cold going in. And, like, I think it was going to be cold regardless because it it was going to happen in the middle of a five-star. It just stands out a bit more since it's happening post-five-star. Yeah. Um, In this match, again, um, everyone's chemistry keeps going. Um, Mayo and Shiri, who just sort of have to beat the shit out of each other as a means to an end, and then Julia and Tam, who seem to enjoy beating the shit out of each other <laughs> like but i feel like both of them get up it's like okay today i'm gonna get ready do my what i normally do to hype myself up for a match and then i'm gonna beat the shit out of the other person <laughs> i mean the disparity between the two feuds is glaring here because aside yeah, one's from one's like a competitive rivalry and the <laughs> other one's like i want you to die why aren't you dead i resent the fact that you have a neck <laughs> julia had one move and it was a ddt and then the rest of it was just utter strikes impassioned fiery beating the shit out of each other the slapping exchange was 
fucking great because it felt real. There was no pulled slaps there. It was they left all the wrestling to Mayu and Suri, all of the brawling to Julia and Tam, and it just it felt so good. And I even enjoyed the fact that Mayu to start off with took on this completely unnatural defensive style against Suri because you could see mm-hmm. what she was talking about in that pre-match promo. I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I want to keep away from those kicks. Eventually, she has to engage Suri because Suri is so strike-heavy and so good (laughs) in that MMA style, so she was able to get Mayu into unorthodox positions. Um, I just I fucking love this. When we get towards the closing stretch where we're hitting moves, but no one is able to cover because all four women are fucking knackered. Just the exhaustion of not... Just basically, they're hitting moves to get some respite because they've just poured... Mm -hmm everything into beating the shit out of each other it was great yeah this is perfect way to send home for both feuds it gave mayu and shiri a fuel line that didn't really have up until that point and again it furthers tam and julia's dynamic i can't remember did julia hear her back she did she hit a backdrop in this match and the backdrop suits julia down to a t really does because especially for how tall she is like she's basically the only people taller than her on the roster is like Himika, so like she can just get them right up and then like fuck your neck down you go. <laughs> well, you make that you you've said that the the closing stretch just it swung from Mayu to Surya just this utterly lunatic pace, um, and then mm-hmm. just as the time limit expired. Suri hit this pile driver on Mayu, which she took all of on a neck and then sold like death. It was. It, I mean, we know that Mayu's neck is made of rubber, um, but it was just. It was such a great way to finish the match of Suri being strong. I mean, I wouldn't have been opposed to Suri pinning Mayu here. You know, have it go twenty eight <laughs> minutes and have Suri pen, pin Mayu. But the time limit draw is. You know, it works. It's fine. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna moan about that. Um, I'm sorry, but when you say um, sales like death, I just imagine <laughs> May you getting powered, getting up. Death. <laughs> imagine, imagine. Takes on the death Yamasan gimmick. Um, Post match, Julia proposes no time limit for the Yokohama matches, which makes perfect fucking sense. Um, and sort of gave me a like, oh, thank God, no more time limits in the main event. Oh, thank you. Well, it, that, that means it would have to go, we, we have like, what, 45 minute time limits for time matches, don't they? Um, so, I yeah, don't know, because they, so. they, they never get anywhere near reaching their time limits. <laughs> Whenever they say there's no time limit, yeah, they go nowhere near. Um, however, I love this match. I think it did such a good job, and we, you know, we've said it quite a couple, we've said it a few times now, that Mayu vs. Shuri was... <laughs> It was a cold few because of the situation, um, because of you know having to cancel back in August. So reheating the feud to the point where I was chomping at the bit to watch this. I really was. And Tam and Julia, I was like, what are they going to do next? Short of actually ripping each other's heads off, they can't go any further by you know without physically killing one of them. Um, but yeah, did a really really good job of this. I gave it nine it made me want to watch more and that's all we can ask for in a main event like this Mm -hmm. that's what you need going into your biggest show of the year so yeah no i'm 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 giving an eight eight, and i completely understand that um i shouldn't let the culture of time limits dictate this but like the culture of time limits is just so tiring to me (laughs) fair enough i'm not i'm not gonna complain fine um So, obviously, this was all to set up what is Stardom's biggest show of the year, which it's a shame that it's in COVID-restricted times, but nevertheless, um, originally at the new Yokohama Budokan, we were supposed to have two nights in August, um, but, of course, those two both got cancelled, and we've condensed them into one night at the Yokohama Budokan on the 3rd of October, Stardom Yokohama Cinderella in front of 1,007 people um right off the bat chris um before we talk about anything this show is easily show of the year what a fucking show it's a great show i think i still prefer ninth anniversary just a little bit but like they're sort of equal pegging for me 
Was that Mo- that was yeah. Momo versus Mayu? Yeah, that was Momo Mayu and Arisa Utami. <laughs> well, I will say the highs on this were higher, but I think um, ninth anniversary was more consistent because a lot of the middle matches here were sort of means to an end, get people over, and I'm completely fine with that. They had a perfect reason to exist, but like as opposed to the other one where it was like almost <clears> a takeover, where every match was ne- was necessary, well, it was like great. So, looking down this card, and I'm 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 not arguing with you. Looking at this card, <laughs> there is one, two, three, well, four, four matches, five, so- six. Out of the nine matches. I would actively encourage people to check out six of them. Yeah, no, it's an incredibly high hit percentage, but that's for me because it's a longer card. It feels like less... Con- like, that's the thing. I like small, condensed bursts of action, like the ninth anniversary. It's just personal preference, and again, they're both as good as each other for me. So Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and what a way to open this show with match one, the high-speed championship, with Azumi the champion retaining, defeating Starlight Kid at 11 minutes and 27 seconds with the modified arm breaker. For a start, they gave the high-speed championship match time, Chris. Oh, my God. It went longer than three minutes. <laughs> it did. <laughs> And like they kept up the pace for three minutes with the oppose with like some of the exception of when we were outside because you know some selling is kind of necessary, but like for the most part it was just a high speed match. The biggest problem of a high speed match being fixed, and that's when you're finally getting into it. It's over, so you were into it for like the whole thing for once, which was great. Um, we mentioned it before about DDT. Oh my god, it's incredible! It, it looks brilliant. It really, really does, mm-hmm. and it goes it. It supports what you said earlier about Starlight Kid. The last couple of months, the improvement, especially in her offensive style, has been really, really telling. And here it was on, it was on, it was on show for everyone to see here. Exactly. Um, not to take away from Mizumiva, who, like, I think is definitely the star of this match, just in terms of how consistently great she is, how good she is at taking advantage of. Um, open limbs like it's an actual fight like if in an actual fight if someone left an arm exposed you would not um let that go you would go straight for that arm which she does every time and it's great she even modified her offense to target starlight's arm like she didn't start Mm -hmm. by attacking the arm we started in a very stereotypical traditional high speed match and then it sort of transcended there was just a moment when you know we talked about starlight versus uh, sorry starlight jungle versus azumi when jungle left her arm exposed and azumi took yeah. um, advantage of it starlight did the exact same here but azumi then modified her offense there was one moment where she did the double foot stomp which she does in every match but she targeted the arm with it and just that subtle thing just got oh it got me so invested i was like yes like, i love that it's, shit it's tough it's more things that should happen more like remember remember in g128 when juice robinson's arm was fucked and then naito did like his drop kick in the corner, but modified it to hit his arm. And then like all of Nitro's shit was around the arm. It was great. And that's, yeah, it's just great. These two wrestle like they're, like they are really familiar with each other, which to be fair, they are because they're in like tag matches against each other. Yeah. Every, like every show. So that makes sense. But like, I can't remember the last time they actually had a, I'm going to check this actually. Last time we actually had a singles match. While you're checking um, that, um, if we were to do a Stardom End of Year Awards, Azumi would be up there as my vote for a Stardom Wrestler of the Year. She's consistently been putting on bangers, and I think she had an absolutely outstanding five-star as well. She's very consistent, but she's not at the point where she's having that of the year yet. That will come. She's, on, she's still only 17, she's, I'm pretty she's sure. She's just turned 18. <sighs> I, I hate talented young that's, people. That's mental. When you consider that Mayu, who quite honestly, in-ring-wise, has been Stardom's wrestler of the year. You know, I'd, I'd, I'm not just saying that because Mayu is my favourite wrestler. I just don't think you can dispute that. Every match she has put on, you know, you look at her five-star. You oh, look, she definitely has yeah, been. <laughs> there's, there's just no, there's no touching that. Even when she's been losing in the five-star, she's been putting over opponents. Um, she's 27, maybe 28 now, which means that Azumi's got another 10 years. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Think about how good Azumi is going to be in ten years. Jesus. According, 
Um, I'm, I'm assuming she doesn't become like another Huziki who leaves early, and I hope, hope not. not. I Fingers really crossed. Yeah, that would be great. But um, their last singles match was January fourth, twenty eighteen. So it's been a while since their singles match, if cage match. Dot net is to be believed, but uh, yeah, this this is what sort of the high speed thing is. Um, championships best at these short burst sprints mm. and all killer no filler. Uh, as many cliches that you like to throw in there, just all of them. Um, I get it like an eight, which is more than I thought I'd be giving it going in because I thought I'd be going like two minutes. So, yeah, absolutely. The fact that they gave it time gives it far more scope to be a high eight for me. Um, I loved it. It got me. It got me. It grabbed you straight on, and it it was a relentless pace throughout the eleven minutes. So yeah, absolutely banging match. As we, to be fair, we did know it was going to be. If it was given the time, there's no way mm. that these two weren't going to put on an absolute belter, and they did. So yeah, what a fire starter! I think it's for don't, <laughs> a twisted don't. fire oh, starter. Oh, you bastard! <laughs> <And instigate. laughs> um, but um. Looking at it, because like it's weird, because it's almost like this was taken from a mid card. Like in terms of like the normal pacing of these big stardom shows, it normally starts with the kind of matches we see, the next three matches that we'd be seeing, like a death match, a match with one of the children, um, a sire, either tag match, stuff like that, and then goes into the title matches. So it's weird. It's almost like this is just taken out of a mid card and put there, and like sort of the pacing of the show from now on sort of reflects that up until we get to the top five. I agree. Um, I think if you were going to do it in a traditional way, opening it with what would be what we're going to go into now, match two, that's that's not the way you want to open a your biggest show of the year, but also a match that's on pay per view. Mm-hmm. So you've had to pay for this. You don't want to pay for this and have your opening match be you know n- not a dud, but an introduction to a wrestler that's not been part of the Stardom roster. So you want something that's going to engage people. You want a match that's going to basically set Twitter alight, you know, spread the word about how fucking good this show was, and that's the perfect match to do it to. Speaking of debuts, uh, of which there was quite a few on this show, uh, we go on to match two, with Mina Shirakawa debuting and defeating Hannon at five minutes and seven seconds with the implant DDT. (laughs) Ah, okay. I'm not so, making that up. That is legitimately no. her finish. The implant DDT. First of all, um, have you seen the, promo- the main promotion she has listed on Cage Match? The best body Japan pro body wrestling. Body Japan pro wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Which I am pretty sure I've seen posted about somewhere, but I'm not quite sure where. <laughs> um, you don't want to wear. You don't want to tell everyone on the podcast where you've seen that. No, literally, I've literally no, I've literally seen that somewhere, but I don't know where I've seen it, and and it's going to annoy me because it's going to because I I think someone was memeing about it in one of the Piero groups. Anyway, um, looking at her career, she's mostly been like Tokyo Joshi um, and DDT. But to be fair, if her, if her um. <laughs> If her matches are as tip based as um, we'd be led to believe by her name, that would make sense. Um, you can't really tell how she is as a wrestler against Hannon. Like, Hannon's good, but she's a child. Yeah. And in five minutes so, as well. Yeah. Well, you can tell how someone is in five minutes. You just can't tell what their full potential is. She looked fine here. Everything was clean. There was no botches. I, she didn't actively annoy me. Which is more than can be said for most people. Um, most, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a grumpy old fuck, aren't you, mate? I'm, but I'm so young. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it was fine. No issues, but also, but there's nothing I can really take from a Hannah match. Um, she did have a time match in the guy in the guy, and that was good. Mm. So, you know, but maybe she'll be fine. I don't know where she's being placed in the card. You probably know. You've done reading, so you probably know more than I do. So. I imagine um, if you remember the discussion we had when we first started the podcast, so this is back in January, um, we talked about Bushi Rodo taking over Stardom and how they'd be pushing, in inverted commas, the good-looking wrestlers. Um, and yeah, the thing is, that was what was coming out, but that hasn't really been. It hasn't. Like Jungle and Momo, they've been getting constant, like who were named as some of the quote unquote unattractive wrestlers were getting pushed. Yeah, so. exactly. Momo was the name that stood out, which is just, it's just 
absolute lunacy, but there we are. If that was to be, you know, believed, then Mina Shirakawa is, you know, certainly going to be up a mid card. You can't tell at the moment, like you say, um, at the moment her gimmick seems to be former model has big boobs, um, and certainly they are leaning into that with uh, her stardom tag league um, team, which we'll get into in a moment. But, what you know, she's her nickname is the Fighting H Cup Gravier Wrestler. I don't even know what that means. But what? what sorry, say that again. Her, her nickname apparently is the Fighting H Cup Gravier Wrestler. Now, I don't know what Gravier means, but uh, that's apparently her nickname. Um, I will say she has only been wrestling for two years. She started in August 2018, so... Yeah, two years experience. For two years, she looked she looked fine. She looked good for two years, but also it's, it's hard enough to justify to people why I watched Stardom. Yeah, this is this is gonna make it worse. Everything on Twitter at the moment has been gifts of Tam touching her boobs, which you know I quickly have to scroll up just in case anyone is looking over my shoulder at what I'm looking at on Twitter. So, thanks for that, Mina. We appreciate that. Lifelong gifts, lovely. Um, anyway, let's move on to yet another debut. Uh, match three saw Saeed and Rio defeat Natsu Samir and the debuting Yuna Manas at 8 minutes and 39 seconds, with Saeed getting the pinfall with a bridging Northern Light suplex. Um, now, this was a fairly standard tag match used mainly to introduce the freelancer Yuna Manas. Uh, she's just wrapped up with Tokyo Joshi Pro, uh, another Tokyo Joshi Pro wrestler that uh, started with Nick. Um, won't be the won't last. Won't be the last. <laughs> not even in the last. Though not even the last of the next two matches. Um, however, I felt she struggled a little bit with timing. She sucked. <laughs> um, like when when stuff was fine, she was great. It was just timings. It was it was also selling. She didn't. She didn't seem to sell appropriately. She didn't seem to run the ropes properly. Like, nothing about her seemed to scream someone who should be working in the biggest women's promotion. Mm. And, like, even the way she took Cyrita's slap, she wasn't selling it like she was in pain. She was selling it like she was being slightly perturbed. And I, I don't know. Just, I, I don't know who, who signed her, but they clearly don't care about good wrestling. <laughs> I, it's one match. I mean, there it, have been wrestlers who have debuted, had wank matches, and have then gone on to be very, very good wrestlers. I don't think we can say, you know, from a tag team match with with Saya Ida and Natsu Samir, I don't think we can judge properly. Again, looking at a cage match profile, there are people that have said, you know, she was really good in Tokyo Joshi Pro. Again, I know nothing about Tokyo Joshi Pro. I think Chris knows slightly more than I do, but only I, slightly. I I know a bit more. Um, like I basically, I've been meaning to actually check them out, but most of what I see is when um, TJPW wrestlers end up in DDT, and it looks fine. But the problem is, the, it's another one of those things where, like, I wouldn't, I don't. I, what starts me getting into it is the fan base is mostly Makiito weirdos, and I, d I don't want to have to have to discuss them to talk about wrestling that I enjoy. So. Fair enough. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a couple of moments where Manas was. A little bit off a game. There was a moment when Rio came off the top ropes for a cross body, and I think she was supposed to roll through and pick her up, but just couldn't get the grip. So that was a little bit awkward. There was a moment where um, her and Natsu had got Sayurida and Rio in opposite corners, and Manas had to keep looking round to check if Samir was ready. And then she went. It was, it was just a little bit clunky. I've got the feeling that if she is to be a mainstay on the Stardom roster. You know, even if she's to remain a freelancer, but to wrestle for any lengthy amount of time on the Stardom roster, that she will get better. She'll she's in a very Himika style mold, but she's nowhere near as smooth as Himika. Not from this tag match, anyway. And I think that's what we're going to mm -hmm. take from that. It's one match with you know a fairly low key match. It could be anything. It could be the situation has got to it. We we don't know. We need we need more before we can make any sort of judgment um but this certainly wasn't a good match um it was nice to have the new green-haired Saeeda winning um i think this might be the first match i've ever seen her win um so especially after natsu samir pretty much finisher spammed for about two minutes and somehow that wasn't the fucking finish 
<laughs> WWE 2K19 bullshit, right? Literally, there. Natsu Samira had stored all her finishes and hit all of them, and then Rio came in to break it up. I was like, how the fuck is that not the finish? Yeah, well, Rio needs to look strong. That so. is true. Um, so, yeah, that's that. I gave it four stars. It's it's not one I would check out. I get it, F4 as well. So, match four um, saw the much-teased Donna Del Mondo fifth member, uh, Natsupoi, defeat Death Yamasan at four minutes and 52 seconds with the bridging German suplex. Uh, Natsupoi is another freelancer who was last seen in stardom in 2016, taking part in that year's five-star, before going on to Tokyo Joshi Pro, and is now back. And, uh, side note, was also trained by Unimanas. So... There you are. <laughs> make of that. Make of that what you will. Um for a five minute for a five minute death match, um, it was <laughs> it was quick, crisp. A death match. Yeah, exactly. Um it was I can see her only being an asset to the high speed division, and the quicker that I get a Natsupoi versus a Zumi match, which seems to be where we're heading next, I am all for that because she seemed quick everything hit everything looked natural everything looked smooth and crisp i i can see it being nothing but an asset chris um yeah again there's not much you can discern from a death match but she's um very consistent it's a good person to put newcomers against on this case returning comers and she lo- she looked cool. Her moveset looks good. Nothing was botchy. She brings a big stick to the ring and looks like someone our great showman. And hey, I think that's cool. And yeah, that's that's big. What? What? It's you're so upset. That I don't like great. But I like great showman, and I've never understood. I'm not. Do you know what? I've got nothing against the great showman. What I do have an issue with is being a primary school teacher and going through a phase of seven months of hearing nothing but that fucking soundtrack sung by children who only know half the pissing words and can't decide a key to sing it in. <laughs> That's the issue I have. What's your least favorite song on the soundtrack from All that of them. experience? I, do you know what? Actually, no, I hate This Is Me. This Is Me is the worst thing to grace radio what airwaves. You break me down to dust. Chris, you Chris. Fun? Yes, I love you, yes. brother. But shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't like it, do you? Have you heard Catcher singing it? She actually sings it really well. I gave this five stars. Um, <laughs> as I've said, the quicker we get Natsupoi and Izumi in any sort of match, I am absolutely down for that because the exchanges that they had in Nagoya were brilliant. So, yeah, I, I look forward to that. And I look forward to seeing more Natsupoi matches because, again, from the four minutes and 52 seconds she was in with a comedy wrestler, she seemed very good. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Five, I have a million dreams of the matches she could be having in Stars. <laughs> Words cannot describe how much I hate you right now. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, match five then saw a match for the vacant SWA undisputed world women's title. Uh, of course, the mat- the uh, title having been vacated by Jamie Hayter earlier on in the year, um, which saw B Priestley defeat Momo Watanabe at 10 minutes and 52 seconds with the Queen's landing. Bit of a grudge match, Chris, with B's history of turning on Queen's Quest and then repeatedly calling out Momo for being crap. <laughs> um, yeah, she didn't drop Momo on her head, so, you know, it's, it's an improvement from her main match. Positive, yeah, absolutely. But... Um, this match was fun. Like it felt longer than it was, not because it was bad, but because I felt they packed in a lot. It's a very dense match. Um, the, some of the kicks from Momo were like gunshots. B's a really good heel, and like a booking sense, this is sort of a means to an end because they very clearly want the SWA belt on um, someone not from Japan, so it can be defended against most of the roster. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know. When Itami was holding it, I feel he she barely defended it. But one defense I remember was against fucking what's her name Zoe Lucas. Mm. 
And of course, that wasn't great because it was Zoe Lucas. <laughs> Poor Zoe Lucas. She's not that bad. <laughs> she's not that bad, but like she's not on your Tommy's level. Not, no, I agree. She's not that good. She's not that good either. Bless um, her. but yeah, but I'm kind of happy that Bees kept the Queen's Landing, and because against Momo, she's like she's thick as about as thick as she is tall. So it looks impressive while not being looking bad because when B does it on someone around her height, it looks a bit awkward. Like when she did it to Mayu, I think. No, did she do it to Mayu? She must have done it to Mayu at some point. It looks a bit awkward. Mm. I quite I love the fact that you mentioned the kicks because there was one moment, it was about a minute, two minutes into the match. The match went to the outside. B sitting on the floor. And I don't know if she didn't see that Momo was going to kick her in the back because she didn't tense <laughs> properly. But May, uh, Momo kicked her in the back and B just screamed, oh my God! And you could just tell that she was <laughs> winded and she was down for fucking ages. <laughs> I don't know why. It really, really tickled me. Um, proper visibly shocked and winded B, bless her. But that, yeah, it was fucking horrible. Um, that leads to Momo kicking the post early on. And I, I haven't seen many, if any, B Priestley limb matches. We mentioned it earlier in a match with Saya. Um, I think she did pretty well with it. I mean, she targeted it pretty relentlessly for a good portion of this match. There was a one-legged crab from in between the ropes, which looked great after she kicked Momo off the ropes via a leg. Um, yeah, they played on the fact that they knew each other really well from their times in Queen's Quest with loads of reversals. Um, there was a wonderful spot from um, Momo where she reverses a Queen's Landing straight into a Kamigoye. That looked fucking brilliant. Um, and yeah, overall, I really, really enjoyed this match. B does eventually win, hitting a B trigger and then the Queen's Landing. But overall... I did enjoy the match. I enjoyed it, I think, a little bit more than you did. I I still really enjoyed it. It's just... Beyond... Like, there wasn't a massive... I, I, I don't know what it is if I hold it back. It just kind of something held it back from greatness. Because I don't think it's for length. We had a match around this length in the opener, and it was great, so... I know, but again, as in the booking terms, this fulfills this like scratches every edge because I'm looking at this going, yeah, this all makes great sense because it's a we got a grudge match and got the SWA title on the type of wrestler we wanted to be it to be on. So yeah, absolutely, what would you give that? High seven, approaching an yeah, eight. Yeah, I gave it a low eight, so that's about that's about the same then. Yeah. So then, <laughs> we move to. Um, match six, and this is a weird one. Uh, the losing unit must disband no disqualification tag team match with Oida Tai defeating Tokyo Cyber Squad at 30 minutes and 7 seconds when Konami turns on Jungle Kiona. Now, Chris, I'm not going to say get out, get out your bingo that card. I didn't you call Konami. this about two months ago. But I called this, <laughs> and I was still shocked. <laughs> I think it, that's the thing, because I think it's been drawn out so much that you're just sort of like, ah, they're probably just going to disband a tie at this point, because fuck a tie. But, yeah, I, I was still sort of like, oh, okay. I think it's because um, Konami did a great job of, like, working with but not working with Jungle throughout the match. Like, they did, like, a huddle at the beginning, but then after that, they weren't really working together throughout a lot of the match. There was out. And then, Sorry, Chris. Then you had, but and then you had TCS coming out attacking everyone. Yeah, you'd got. There was a sense of a united front from the majority of Tokyo Cyber Squad, and that plays into something I want to talk about in a second. There's a moment when um, Tora is about to come off the rope uh, to put Jungle through a table, and Rina and Hina. Who uh, not Rena and here Rena and Rawaka, who I had forgotten had come out, were there holding onto her legs, <laughs> desperate to keep her from putting Jungle through the table. And I thought that was really nice. Konami, considering she was in this match, she did a great job of not being in this match because mm -hmm. it was pretty much all Jungle. There was a wonderful bit of foreshadowing, and it took me twice watching it to actually pick it up. 
the pre-match promo from uh, Tokyo Cyber Squad, of which they were all in, Death, Rina, Ruaka, Jungle, Konami, there was one person not wearing a Tokyo Cyber Squad shirt. Konami. Oh, that's um, that's some One Piece for <laughs> foreshadowing bullshit that's right f- there. Honestly, I watched it. I, I watched it. Didn't pick anything up, and then I and then I was like, I'm sure she was just wearing a Stardom, and she was. She was just wearing a Stardom Yokohama Cinderella shirt, and everyone else was wearing Tokyo Cyber Squad shirts. That's brilliant. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, beyond that, like the actual contents of this match, there's not a ton to talk about. We've seen. TCS taken a wet attire a fair bit mm-hmm. recently. Apart from one pile driver. <laughs> oh my god, the pile the table. driver. It's, I said this before we came in there, it's almost like Jungle and Konami went, right, so um, Tori, we we have to admit, you did not have a great five star by anyone's standards. She fucked a lot of and, people off, let's put it that way. Yes. Um, first, I heard about these two guys from the UK on this podcast and we just sort of kept ripping on you so we need to make them happy <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to like Bret Hart I'll drive you but also you're going to die <laughs> It was almost like Tora completely forgot how to sell a pile driver and thought, I'm not going to tuck my neck straight away. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for my head to crash into the table. Then I'm going to tuck my neck. I don't need to tuck my neck. Gravity will tuck my neck. She took me. it all on the crown of her head. And it was like, it, oh, it looked a little bit, it looked uncomfortable anyway, because you could see Jungle's legs shaking as she was doing it. Um, but yeah, it was it was a great spot. Um, the fact that it didn't lead to the finish was like, oh, fuck. Um, but then you got Saki and Konami dueling with chairs, and then Saki sort of drops her chair, I... and Konami lays I... into jungle with it, and that leads to the pinfall. And it was like, oh, shit. Two things. One, the dueling chair thing. Am I the only one who hears like, um, the Phantom Menace theme? <laughs> When people start tuning with chairs, like do 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 do, and also, yeah, my my, it's like in the Simpsons, you can pause it and go, and you can see the exact moment where a heart breaks. Ding, ding. You can. <laughs> it was. It was very very similar to that. And do you know what made it even better? The fact that you could hear a fucking pin drop in that arena during the last bit. I mean, I've put my match rating here. I've put seven stars for the match rating, but the drama was ten out of ten. I mean, we cut mm. to the end of this match and Konami is slouched in the corner of the ring. She chastises Jungle, just basically going, TCS is dead, it is entirely your fault, it was always going to happen. And then she leaves, Jungle screams at her to come back and she doesn't, she just leaves her in the ring, broken, on her own, because TCS are on, the rest of TCS are on the outside jungle at this point is absolutely hysterical again to the absolute silence of the yokohama crowd which adds so much gravity to this entire thing um she cries to the heavens she cries to the rest of her teammates tells them to leave go your own way i'm sorry that i couldn't save tcs so they all leave pretty much straight away which was like oh okay fine (laughs) Bye. Wait, yeah, Cobra. Bye. <laughs> no, no, I was joking. Wait. Um, and then Jungle leaves on her own, defeated, and that was the end of TCS. What we do need to like really get the answer to, and there's like the biggest angle I think coming out of um, this is who's going to adopt Def Yamasan because we can't have her running wild. Well. That sort of plays into <laughs> Nagoya and something Mayu says. I don't know if that's final, but we'll get into that in a minute because I'm sure we'll we'll get into that when we get into Nagoya. Well, that's well when you that's just in storyline perspective. That's two um, factions of jungles being lost to her in with in two years. Like she lost Jan last year and she lost um, TCS this year. Whose fault was it that she lost Jan, or was that just? Jan, it was basically it was all the people who didn't get drafted in the draft the year before, and Jungle was one of them. So she was like, "Fuck it, we're making our own. <laughs> we're gonna make our own team with Blackjack and Hookers." <laughs> Blackjack and Hookers. Whose fault was it that Jan disbanded? Um, the Saddam draft, how that worked. There was a battle royal between Hannah, 
Momo, Mayu, um, Jungle, and Kigatsu. Kigatsu. And um, the basically, if you um, for, there's a possibility for um, everyone to get either a pin or throw another the top rope. And if you're one of the people, if you're the person who didn't get the pin, your team is disbanded, and because they didn't want five teams in stardom for some reason. <laughs> and then Donna Del Mondo came in and fucked it oh, all up. It would have been so much better if Oida Tai was the reason that Jan had disbanded as well. Just adding that little wrinkle of storyline. Yeah, well, what what it was, it was um, Hannah who eliminated Jungle, and then Jungle was the first recruited into TCS. Ah, there you go. So. Ultimately, a really, really, really sad end to this match. And I really did feel sorry for whatever had to try and follow this match. because mm. Not because of the well, match, think... not because of the in-ring quality, though that but pile driver. Grandma, yeah. But yeah, because of all of the drama that then ensued. You've got Jungle, who is probably the best promo in the entire company um, for just yeah. flat-out emotion. No, I, th- I think you're completely forgetting the amazing... If you say Deku um... I swear to fucking God, Chris. I'll shut you, you were going to say death, weren't you? <laughs> I was going to say um, Did you notice, by the way, that throughout all this, throughout Jungle crying to the heavens, Jungle crying after Konami, one of her best friends who's turned her back on a ju- death was still doing the death hands. Just completely belying it. She does not know <laughs> any other way. That was her emoting. No, it like, was great. She, she's like, um, do you know the Pokemon Wabafet? Of course I don't. Right, so basically that has like a little tail, but then that's the tail of the actual Pokemon and with the big blue thing, and the big blue thing is meant to be the Pokemon, but actually isn't the Pokemon. So I think that's like that. I think there's like a little thing like behind her that we can't see. Do you think we'll ever get through a Stardom cast without you mentioning Pokemon? Um, It's unlikely. <laughs> Um, so we move on to the match that had the unfortunate uh, responsibility of following that, which was the Goddess of Stardom Championship match with uh, the champions, the Queen's Quest team of Yutami Hayashita and Saya Kamatani, defeating the DDM team of Mike and Himika at 22 minutes and 33 seconds with a motherfucking Phoenix splash, Chris. <laughs> splash. Right, we'll get to that in a second. What I will say is the first half, I want to say, of this match. Um, really did stuff because like that jungle promo we ju- we just spent the last bit praising it but like the original broadcast didn't have any um subtitles and even about the subtitles you sort of you sort of like still catching the emotion so... because of the emotion yeah sure yeah it's like um how people whatever followed the undertaker streak not like obviously on the yeah, same level but you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing i could think of all right <laughs> carry on anyway um, but anyway, the the match itself it was a better tag match than when they won the titles. This is a good. Um, it's their first defense, isn't it? Yes, I want to say yes. And yeah, because we won it just before. They won it in so July. Really been... The Cor- the July eighteenth Corican show, did they? Yeah, and then later that month, Five Star started. So yeah, but it's the it's the first opportunity they've had to. Defender and I think first defense is good, especially coming out of the five star of Himika and Micah looking extremely yeah, strong. Definitely. So like so like Saya picking up a win over one of them is great. Um again, Micah continues um the the attempt at being a power wrestler when she's easily the smallest person in this match. Oh, I don't know. Even though Saya um, Kamatani's tall, she's not exactly built. Yeah, is the she? problem is when when someone's tall, it's still a bit weird when you try to like power them around especially when you're not used to being a power wrestler yet i don't know i understand them sort of not being a dick about development in front of us but it's still something that's sort of dragging down mike's matches for now himika continues to like have the best facials in stardom <laughs> she really does and like and like that's um that's include in a place that has jungle but they're like good in different reasons whereas like jungles are like you're in there with raw emotion himika just is almost uncaring at this point She's herself like, hey, I'm cool. I'm I'm big. I can do whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> um, Itami is, of course, great. We haven't actually discussed her winning the five star, me and you. What do you think of that? I think it's a good decision. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. If she, I personally think she hadn't won it this time, she'd have probably won it next time. Um, I know I'd predicted yeah. Momo to win it, and that all sort of hinged around the Jungle Kiona um, sort of 
retribution arc and obviously that's not going to happen happen now so yutami made as much sense as anybody else i i didn't really see who else short of konami maybe um i didn't really see who was going to i didn't see himika as a winner i think they built her fantastically and the fact that she got through to the final makes in, sense in the last in the last day i honestly thought um despite the fact but it was spoiled for me before it was even put out onto stardom world thanks groups that allegedly have a fucking spoiler policy yeah, anyway um the um I, we did a great job of building shuri i thought I, like on the last day if i was watching live i'd legitimately think that she was in the mm, shot definitely um in fact to be honest all four members of ddm came out of this five star looking fantastic yeah it's really well because like julia came out looking like she easily had like the week not in terms of like match quality but in terms of um, wins and losses. She easily had like had the worst compared to expectations. Absolutely. I think she like, had a humbling at the hands of Himika. To be fair, yeah, like Himika's five star was what you expected Julia's five star to be. Yeah, exa- exactly, exactly. She powered through. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean that clothesline off between Utami and Himika, which started as just clotheslines and then sort of developed into neither woman wanting to give ground and just no you will go down. No, you will go down. Just almost this sense of just foolish pride was brilliant. Because it went on for about three minutes, just literally them clotheslining yeah. the shit out of each other and just going down out of exhaustion. I absolutely love that. I I love the little callback between Saya Kamatani and Micah for the Future of Stardom Championship, what seems like ages ago now. There was lovely little callbacks in that little match. I think that Micah... Has imp- I can't believe she's the same wrestler that came in. You know, she had such an amazing five star. You look at the people that she beat. Mm-hmm. She beat Momo. She beat Jungle. They, they, Stardom are clearly putting a lot on Micah. And she's another one who is on all of deceptively these, yeah. young. How old's Micah? I'm just going to have a look now mm. on Cage Match. Uh, Micah is. Doesn't say. That's, that's helpful. <laughs> uh, she has only been wrestling for a year, though. So yeah, she's great for wrestling. May two thousand nineteen, so probably eighteen months. Um, considering she has got so little experience, I think she's she's come on fantastically well. Um, this match overall, it started slow, and I think that is something to do with what you said, Chris, about how you've got to follow just this incredibly emotional moment. Um, but it built to this really, really, really good crescendo. Um. Complete props to Himika for getting both Utami and Saya into the torture rack. Fair fucking play. That is not easy at all, even if you are as strong as Himika is. So, absolute props yeah, to you. Yeah, especially since, like, um, Utami is not... Like, Saya is, like, nothing. Like, into, like she there's nothing on her, but, like, Utami is actually fairly yeah. built. Yeah, completely. So... <laughs> Um and but yeah, that I did not expect to fucking like going back to it. I did not expect that fucking um Phoenix. Flash. Oh my god! Like, like she going up. I'm like, oh, is she introducing like a um moon salt? To that's her, exactly to what her I thought. Set? That's it's like that's cool, but you know, but we have loads of moon salts going around. Like you sh- really shouldn't be taking it. Like I was thinking this as she was going up. I think really fast. Um, <laughs> Just the <was> exposition, like, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> um. The- just going off, and I was like, "Well, you probably shouldn't be taking a moon so That's not what May has been doing, and like she's doing that to call back to like EO. So like maybe don't. And I'm also sick of moon salts because um, Koji Zaki does it, Sonata does it, everyone does a fucking moon salt. Oh my god, it's a Phoenix Flash, <laughs> and then the Phoenix. it was it was a really really impressive one as well. Like I've seen I've seen on Twitter some people going, "Oh, she landed on legs." So fucking what? What you do a fucking she Phoenix Flash? Looking... <laughs> I mean, honestly, like unbelievable. Like I, I don't um get on side. I try not to get inside too much for being like sloppy because again she's been going for a year. Not if that I don't think she, has she even been going a year. When did she start? So in Kamatani, didn't she debut October two thousand nineteen? August two thousand nineteen. August. So she's been going j- so just over a year, and she hasn't had a match in that time where she where she's had more than ten. So um, ten matches in a month. So, yeah, she's doing fucking grand in terms of, like, 
um, move execution. Like literally, the only problem is her selling, which wasn't a problem as much because nothing was being. Nothing was being targeted. Yeah, so that's the thing with, with like the one time she did sell it's because May basically fought her to sell. <laughs> you are going to sell, damn it. Um, yeah, loved it. Hopefully she keeps that as a finish, um, because I just I don't see the running shooting star as her finish. Even good as it looks, maybe keep it as a yeah, absolutely to you know to put away someone like maybe a Hannon or something like that. But I loved it. I love the fact that we got new moves. From Saya, we've got a couple of slams that we haven't seen before, some drivers we haven't seen before. Um, but the fact that she pulled this out was just ridiculous. And what a way to retain the titles. I actually really, really enjoyed this match. Really enjoyed it. I gave it eight. Mm-hmm. The crescendo it built to was really, really good. I really enjoy the chemistry that Utami and Himika have got. Um, so, yeah, I gave it eight, Chris. This is a match I have, like, I have a list of matches I want to get back to rewatching because, like, I feel like context sort of sucked me out of it. Like, here, I feel like um, the promo before sort of sucked me out the first half of this match. Mm. So, like, f- like um, just on a feeling, it's a high seven approaching an eight, but, like, it's one of those ones I want to rewatch because I feel like not um, watching it in a vacuum would do it a lot more favors than watching it from where it's placed on the card. Yeah, absolutely. So. But it was still an absolute banger, as was like all of the top five matches, really, on this mm. card. Moving on, then. Um, spoiler. Sort of a spoiler, anyway. Um, these next two matches are in my top three matches of the year. Um, for Stardom or overall? For Stardom, definitely. And I think one yeah. of them probably top five of any promotion. Um, So we start then with the semi-main event, which was for the Wonder of Stardom Championship, a rematch from a couple of months ago with Julia, the champion, defeating Tam Nakano at 17 minutes and 25 seconds with the glorious driver. Do you remember, Chris, back before COVID... Um, do you remember the match between... No, I don't. I really don't. <laughs> Before COVID. But at such Was a time that even a thing? <laughs> um, between Hiromu Takahashi and Ryu Lee, where they started and it was literally just slapping yeah. the shit out of each other for about seven minutes. Yeah, like literally seven minutes. That was literally how uh, this yeah. match started. Yeah, except not... Yeah, Maybe not just, seven minutes, just, but yeah. that sort of fire, that intensity. And again, they channeled a real they portrayed a real hatred for each other <laughs> yeah it's something you only really get when me and garf talk about jim Cornette. <laughs> um no yeah it, it was fucking nuts like in that sense what this is is they took their five star match which was i think it was between nine and eleven minutes and <laughs> added um about seven eight minutes onto it which just made it better <laughs> It was a war, is what it was. And I said before about how I didn't know how they were going to take what they'd done in these tag matches and building the feud before that, and how they were going to take it to Yokohama and build on it. And somehow they did. And it was just... It was a slugfest. As a wrestling match, there were very, very few moves to talk about short of just trying to proper crush people into the... I mean, towards the end of the match, Julia was literally trying to crush the life out of Tam Nakano, and Tam was literally just not mm-hmm. going down out of pure fucking stubbornness. Okay? You are literally going to have to kill me to keep me down, because she was in the Stealth Viper for what felt like about five minutes, and the dr- the crowd was so behind it, just urging Tam to get to the ropes because there were so many times when the ref was looking at her going, are you going to tap? Are you going to tap? And then she looked like she passed out and then she came to again and Julia's proper wrenching this back. I love the Stealth Viper, by the way. Um, Absolutely wrenching it back and Tam just isn't going down. And just that resilience that Tam was showing got her over as this baby face. And then we got Julia just pounding the shit out of her with that final glorious driver. There was no way Tam was getting up from that. 
Julia for yeah. everything that we've said about her on this podcast. And we were justified in saying, in my opinion, she has she's another one who has come on so much from the Julia that both me and you were so down on winning the Cinderella in the way she won it to where she is now as she's she's that heelish that she's not quite a heel if that makes sense yeah she's sort of like um nwo yeah, like. she is just she's fucking cool the way she wrestles as this arrogant fucking badass literally just slugfest yeah okay she's not the greatest in ring worker she's she's good but she doesn't touch a mayu she doesn't touch a momo but as a pure slugfest a match filled with emotion a blood feud, Julia would be the person I'd want in that. She did really, really well with her feud with Hannah Kimura, and then it, this, for me, has surpassed that feud because this, this was a fucking belter of a match. And it didn't matter who won this match for me because the story they told throughout it of Tam, you know, ultimately this boils down to Tam wanting to sort of justify Arissa to sort of win the title in the name of Arissa. And Julia, out of pure arrogance, just not wanting her to. It's my belt. Fuck off. And just that, um, I loved it. I loved this match, Chris. And it, it's, it was just, it's my type of match. It's a Goto versus Suzuki. It's a, we're not going to wrestle. We're going to fucking beat the shit out of each other. Mm-hmm. Um... This is definitely their best match in the feud because, yeah. again, it's their Cinderella match, but longer, so, like, better. Um, and their first one, which feels like it was 10 years ago at this point, <laughs> um, the first match I thought was a bit bloated, whereas this was the perfect length that it had to be, just bobbing each other into the ground. But yeah, Tam just being from underneath almost the whole time because, like, look at the size differential, of course, that's how it was. Some great, like, somehow, like, in a match that started at 100, it still managed to escalate which is, I think, a sign of a good thing because so many matches, how many matches can be named that started hot and then couldn't live up to um, how it started, whereas here this started hot and managed to escalate. Um, Julia just doesn't seem to respect Tam having a neck, which is the kind of chemistry that I enjoy in my wrestling feuds. The, the, I'm trying to think of... Like the, I think the only person Tam had more chemistry with really is um, is Arisa. Like apart from, her, I think with Julia might just be Tam's best opponent. Well, maybe Kagetsu. Like Tam Kagetsu and Julia. <laughs> but in terms of Julia, this is proof of where she belongs. She's this is her like her feud with Tam's definitely earned her her stripes in stardom for me. Mm-hmm. Because like before that, the only thing I was really holding on to was well, the Hannah match was really good, but then like the time match is sort of like yeah, good, you belong here. Yeah, and I'm more excited to see a white belt run now. I'm st- I'm still a bit skeptical on whether she can do create anything special with, say, if she was put against a B Priestley, I don't think that would work. Whereas if B Priestley was put with like a Mayu or a Tam, that might just work. But in if if they keep putting her with people as special as Tam and if she can keep finding her feet because she's very good at crafting feuds even though like her promo game's not mm. the best like she's she's still she's very good at crafting particular chemistry with particular people like whereas like Tam and Julia's chemistry is really similar to the Hannah Julia yeah. chemistry it's still different it's still particular to those two so if given time and like this feud's been given basically since they came back from lockdown um, Julia can create these really good chemistry with people so yeah but, uh, this feud is definitely how we see Julia's value which I didn't think I'd ever see at the start of the year but yeah. I see it now same here um, yeah and I still don't think she's as good as people say don't get me wrong like people seem to think she's the second coming of um, Jesus Christ but she's still really good and she's under stripes especially from this match um i'm giving it like a mid to high nine it's really 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 good stuff go out your way to check it absolutely. out absolutely can't really uh can't really add anything to that because it's a high nine for me it's it was so close to a 10 and i don't know what stopped it being a 10 but it is it's a damn near perfect well, slugfest 
that's what I've almost always said. It's like in in terms of quality, there's really no difference between a nine and a ten. A ten is like a feeling yeah. you have. Which brings us on to uh match nine, the main event, uh the World of Stardom Championship match, uh with May Wiwatani the champion, uh defeating and retaining against Suri. Uh, with the two-step dragon suplex at 28 minutes and 58 seconds. Holy fuck. <laughs> Holy fuck. This match was everything I wanted it to be and more. It was everything I dared... You know when you build up a match so much in your head and then you get to watch it and you're like, that was in incredibly disappointing or it, it, you, you're like Nakajima versus yeah, Kaito it's, it's good <laughs> but it still disappoints because it's not this fucking worldy you expect it to be that was li- this was literally the opposite I'd built it up mm-hmm. so much in my head and then the match was it, it got to the point in this match where basically we watched a mugging is what happened um, Suri at, she Punted Mayu from pillar to post for nearly half an hour is what happened. There was a moment about 10 minutes in and Suri had had non-stop offense on Mayu and they were on the apron. And Mayu super kicked Suri in the face just to get some degree of separation. And the crowd Mm -hmm. cheered. They cheered a random super kick on the apron because they were that invested in the babyface champion being literally meticulously taken apart by this MMA badass that they cheered just a random bit of offense because it meant that Mayu wasn't dead. And there was so many moments in this match where props to the person who did the camera work, by the way. There were so many moments where you zoomed in on Mayu's face. And there was a moment, we were about 20 minutes in, where Mayu just looked defeated. In her face, she just looked like, I don't know, I genuinely don't know how much longer I can weather this storm. And then there was a moment Mm -hmm. where Siori kicked out of a moonsault and it zoomed in on Mayu's face again. And Mayu is just looking completely like, what the fuck have I got to do to put this away? That was my one shot. What do I do? And just that entire mm. drama for 30 minutes, which sounds like a long time. It wasn't. It flew. It really did. I didn't realize this match. I legit didn't realize this match was 30 minutes until I opened up the cage match um, page for this show as we were coming exactly. on Exactly. And it, it wasn't just Mayu. Like anyone that listens to this podcast knows that I'm a massive Mayu mark. And Mayu was great in this match. And as we've already said on this podcast, she is easily wrestler of the year in stardom. Suri was fucking phenomenal in this match. She came across as this meticulous, cerebral badass that just slowly but surely took apart this person who's been putting on banger after banger after banger these her strikes like there was one point where may was literally in tears because Siori is kicking her that hard and you you you, you mm. it got and her, her, her kicks um look like gunshots they look and sound like gunshots. it got to the point where he's a little bit uncomfortable to watch and that mm. just made it for me because to be a champion and to be someone fighting from underneath, you need a really, really good partner to make that believable. And Suri did that in spades. I, it got to the point where I want Suri to have that red belt at some point because she would put mm-hmm. on fucking belters. Now, I know that you know she's a freelancer, or was. Um, I believe she's wrapping up freelance dates, and I think she is going to be signed to stardom. I see that as a positive towards her being a real main player in this promotion because here, holy fuck, I I can't say enough good things about this match. You need to go and check it out. It's my match of the year. For stardom. In general, for stardom, yeah. Um, In terms of match of the year, it's definitely like top five. I don't think it cracked um, May versus Ahara. 
and um, the tag, we could get to his retirement tag match. And like, there's, there's still a few ahead of it, but this is still wholly worthwhile. Definitely best match of the night. Shiri is such a presence. Like, she is really expressive sometimes to the point of being annoying. <laughs> and I do think that can somewhat take away from when she's on top because that sort of screaming intensity, I think that's better suited to a comeback. But like, she was more subdued here. Like, she was only really screaming by the end when she was seemingly getting mm. desperate because May hadn't been put away. So that worked. Um, like, Shuri sort of looked at her flaws and was like, well, if we put this like, in the match, that'll work better, which is good. May just... I don't, there's just points of this match where she crumpled and it's like, oh my god. I think that's the true sign of an ace figure where you start, like, rooting for them no matter, like, how much you want them to win yeah, or not. Absolutely. Like, Tanahashi... Like Tanahashi is the same aura where he can go into a match and like in every booking sense, I don't want Tanahashi to win like any match he's ever in, but I forget that when I'm watching a Tanahashi match. <laughs> like sort of the same with me, where it's like I'd I would probably find it more interesting if Shuri had the red belt. I'd have found it more interesting if um half the people she'd fought this year had the red belt, but it doesn't matter. Because by the time you're halfway into a match, you're like, "Oh my god, I want male to uh, May, male. I want May to win more than I want my next breath." So, yeah, it's just, it's just a perfect clash of personalities. The, the, fo- the feud could have been hotter going into what is. I know it's no bigger than like their standard Corican size, but in terms of like production, it's their biggest match of the year. And actually, I think that's something that really added to this. The bigger arena really added to. Um, this match just an, an aesthetic thing like I don't think this match would have worked quite as well if it was just in Corrigan no I agree they needed a big match to tie off this big show because you know I've already spoke about how personally this is show of the year for me and how we had really really good matches that outstanding semi main and you needed just something to tie it off you needed a big mm-hmm. match and, and this was it and you're absolutely right you know you desperately wanted Mayu to win because of the drama the two women were able to put into this match to exude to this crowd. And yeah, sure, there was only a shade over a 1,000 people in what is, I believe, a 3,000-seater venue. But even so, mm. well, it just it felt big. It seemed big. What I also think is worth mentioning is that it was very, very easy for this match to fall into the trap that the tag match did, because following Julia versus Tam of Aiders, this winter and all guns blazing, it would have fallen flat, but we had a bit of a technical start. We were having a bit of a chain wrestling start to slowly get the crowd mm-hmm. into it. Absolutely. Because um, if it just went in all guns blazing, A, the feud doesn't demand it, <laughs> and um, B, you just had the best example of what a match like that can mm-hmm. be, so... It would have done badly, so we saw that and went right. Let's just have a slower start, and then we'll escalate it. So, it's just in terms of a main event, it's perfectly paced, perfectly timed. Um, some se- I remember at the time, some segments feeling like they could have been um, either longer or shorter. Like the pacing wasn't always there, but like even reading my notes, I can't really find evidence of that. It was just a feeling I was having at the time. So it it really doesn't affect the match if I didn't feel the need to actually write it down. No. Like if I and this this is just like if I have to give one criticism um one criticism to this match, because really it's not a match that has major flaws. Unless you really don't like sh- the sound of Shuri screaming because you will It gets a little excessive. Um but yeah. I'm willing to like I mean this match is a bona fide ten stars. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to go ten. That's around. I'm, I haven't settled on a rating for it yet. And going back and this always happens when a match this good happens. They go back and forth and mad. When ultimately it doesn't matter. <laughs> so. Again, it, it you said it earlier. It's, it's a feeling, and I know they're completely subjective. With again, we're two knobheads on the internet, so it doesn't really matter what we say. Go and check out this show <laughs> that being said please listen to our <laughs> um opinion weekly www.podmania.co.uk um subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts um go and check out this show and go and check out these two final matches because they are two of the best stardom matches of the year so far that main event especially but tan versus julia is outstanding as well please please go and check them out 
overall, I thought Stardom delivered in spades for this Yokohama show. It's it's a shame. It's such a shame that they couldn't have had a full house. Those three, imagine those three thousand people allowed to cheer, allowed to properly get into this match as Mayu is mounting these comebacks, yet just to be kicked, decapitated by Shuri again, and she collapses again, and the crowd are proper pumped. You've got Starlight Kid banging on the apron to proper get the crowd into it. It would be incredible. Um, Honestly, I think that's what's holding fifth, and actually most matches from this year from being a 10 for me. It's difficult. It's the lack of crowd interest. And like, I know I shouldn't mark it down, but also like, there has been matches that's been so good it's broken through that. That's mostly because they worked the match to not have gaps for crowd interaction yeah yeah i agree um so moving on the day after this show we had the stardom nagoya rainbow fight show from the 4th of october uh, this was from the nagoya international conference hall in front of 282 people now this we're not going to go into detail on the matches per se um it's more about the storylines. Um, and as Jungle Kiona says, it's it's more of a reset um, coming out of Yokohama. So forgive us if we don't go too much into each of these matches, but we will be talking about them. I, I have nothing to say for any of the matches. I it's all just Exactly. Booking, so, so we'll go into um, more detail on basically the storylines coming out of this. So match one, saw Saya Ida defeat Hannon at 7 minutes and 3 seconds with a Northern Lights suplex. She's going on a little bit of a mini run, is our Saya Ida. Um, match two, saw Konami and Saki Kashima uh, defeat Starlight Kid and Riho at 8 minutes and 7 seconds with a triangle arm lock. Konami, by the way, Chris, who looks like she's been adopted by Team Rocket um, and has become Dark <laughs> Konami. <laughs> Who's making the point on references <laughs> I knew you'd now, love that Rob? one. I knew um, you'd love that one. <laughs> pre- prepare for trouble. Did we have a little they cat? They did not have them? a little cat with them, unfortunately. Uh, that that yeah. would complete it. Who's Jeff? Who, who's Jeff? I, who's I don't know Team Rocket to that extent, mate. I remember Team Rocket from the cartoon. That's all I remember. And I know that basically dark Pre- Pokemon used to go to them. That's it. That's all I remember. Um, prepare for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Shadow Konami and Saki Kashima won. Um... I never really asked you about this um, whilst we were talking about Yokohama. What is your opinion on Konami as part of a Weedata? I know we've spoken about it previously because I think we we actually talked about this being a possibility earlier on in the year, and I'm pretty sure we both said that it was probably the best thing for Konami, especially the way she was wrestling, that aggressive style uh, in the Five Star. Um, Mm. Are you a fan of Konami as part of a Weedata? Do we like... A weed of time now, now that we've got B Priestley back, and now with the addition of Konami, and you know, whenever Jamie Hayter comes back, it's definitely improved. Like, I definitely now, not, I'm no longer just seeing Saki Kashima and uh, Natsu Katora and going, Oh, fuck, the next 10 minutes of my life are going to yeah. be wasted. Um, but at the same time, we don't know how it's going to go. A weed of time might be one of those things that are just so bad that it makes even good things around them bad you know they could just be like the cucumber of wrestling so <laughs> i want that to be their tag team nickname i really want them what, the, the cucumber of wrestling no but it's true because cucumber takes like fucking solid solidified piss right and then if you put it in a salad that whole salad tastes like cucumber it's right. awful just how do you know what solidified piss tastes like? Is it just is it a hard not life up in Scotland? Is that what it is? Just sometimes there's nothing to eat but just solidified piss. You, I don't call you out on the weird things you say. I don't say weird shit like that, Chris. But I don't know. It just doesn't take. Like I imagine if piss became like a solid. Actually, it's poop to solid pit. No, right, let's okay, move on. Yeah, fair enough. On. Um, <laughs> I like Konami as part of Weeda Tai. I think she's got more freedom as part of Weeda Tai. I think she wrestles quite naturally a heel style anyway. Um, mm-hmm. The more aggressive submission style she's been wrestling recently, should I say, um, lends itself more naturally to being a heel action. So, And plus, that means we've got another Weeda Tai wrestler who will actually finish a fucking match. So, you know, there is that as well. <laughs> um <laughs> Match three then saw Tam Nakano defeat Mina Shirakawa at 10 minutes and one second with a German suplex. Um, Tam, 
afterwards appreciates the guts of Mina and offers the chance to join up in Tag League, which Mina accepts. So, Chris, do you want to add anything to that? I know you watched the uh, Tam Nakano match, uh, Tam Nakano and Mina match, um, and did you have any thoughts on it? Um, no, not really. It's like a 5 out of 10 type affair. Oh, solid, nothing bad. I I still don't know what I think about um, Shirakawa. I guess Tag League might help for that because I think she's not. I don't think she's going to be a um, singles wrestler for the next wee bit anyway. And like yeah. you know, what started them like we're going to build her up in tag matches way before. Apart from we didn't do that with Julia, which is why I think I hated her <laughs> at first. But yeah, I don't I don't know what to think about her yet. I I didn't notice um, the um, the boo through line that you mentioned, yeah. but now that now that I heard it, I'm looking back and thinking. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yes, and I don't know how I feel about that because it's sort of like, I know if I still feel if that's like what we're going to go for, I feel the same way about that as I did about the um, Julia and Tam cat fight from earlier in the year, where it's just sort of like, this feels like 90s Vince Russo. This bullshit. is a company that does the bikiniing every year, though. Yeah, no, and I don't know. No, like neither, <laughs> neither do I. Neither do I. I don't watch women's wrestling to, for that reason. That's not why I watch it. That's not why I watch Stardom, but each to their own. Yeah, and it's one of those annoying things where, like, Stard, it's it's what it's what stopped me initially getting into Stardom because I'm just sort of like, I don't, I know exactly what kind of thing that's going to breed, but eventually I just heard too much hype and I tried it and fell in love yeah. with it. But um, like, because there's legitimate reasons to watch Stardom. For example, you can have a great match with a really well told story and not waste an hour of your life. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> New, New Japan, Japan. but. <laughs> <laughs> but but then you get you know that shit <laughs> so it, it's a two-sided coin but i'm still sort of i don't know how to articulate my thoughts on it properly yet yeah. but you know but uh, when it comes to this match five out of ten it was fine i have no problem with shirakawa yet but we'll see how tag league goes but you sense that there might be impending problems that you have with shirakawa i hope to be fair, half the time when I sense impending problems, it's just because I'm in a bad mood and need somewhere to put it. <laughs> um, match four then saw Natsu Katora and B Priestley of Oida Tai defeat Mayu and Jungle Kiona at 11 minutes and 40 seconds with the stretch muffler. Um, pre-match promo, we saw Mayu and Jungle join forces um, to show the strength of the betrayed uh, jungle doesn't know who to trust. Obviously she's still a bit skittish having encountered what she encountered at the hands of Konami. Um, she then gets completely annihilated by Oida Tai um, and Nats Katora taps her out with a uh, stretch muffle. In fact, I think it's a referee stoppage as opposed to jungle actually tapping out. Um, she then gets chastised by all of the Oida Tai, including Konami who just completely eviscerates the poor girl Um Nagoya, which is Jungle's hometown, really not doing that well for her at the moment, is it? Um, she goes. No, she never does. No, she Nagoya. really doesn't now. It's like CM. It's like CM Punk in <laughs> Chicago. Um, she apologizes to the crowd for being so awkward. Uh, Mayu steps in, says she doesn't feel like she's awkward at all. Offers her a place in Stars, which Jungle accepts. At this point, um, it's where he realizes that Jungle's leg is actually in a full leg brace. Uh, which I've never seen before uh, immediately after a match, and that should have thrown up some um, some red flags, which I'll get, a, get into in a minute. Um, but Mayu then apparently offers this um, offer, which extends to the remaining people in Tokyo Cyber Squad as well. So in answer to your earlier question, Chris, it looks like we might be getting death in stars, which doesn't well, I'm fit. Looking at, I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the card for... Um, the goddesses of Stardom shows and Death appears to have changed her uh, she name. She hasn't just changed her name, Chris. Um, I'm sure you will see a gif very shortly of what she looks like now. Um, but yes, she is now part of Stardom. <laughs> when you say that, are you sending me it or do I need to send? <laughs> um, I will send you a gif of it later. Um, however, we we spoke about Jungle um being in that leg brace. Um, she then broke on Twitter that she'll be out for an extended period of time due to a left knee ACL rupture, which is a minimum of six to nine months recovery. 
Uh, she's got a right knee lateral collateral ligament rupture, which is 8 to 13 weeks recovery. Um, she's got a right shoulder, can't read that word, joint complete dislocation, which is 9 to 15 weeks recovery. Um, and the left knee and the right shoulder, they both require surgery. Um devastating news for jungle after everything she's been through this year on a personal level and in the ring to then have this as well that's awful it's absolutely crippling mm-hmm. for the poor woman yeah it's it's awful <laughs> just properly good because yeah she's my favorite in stardom and she's yeah. gone and she's gone for an extended period yeah. of time as well for a long time, yeah. So I need to find a new stardom favorite. It's, pr- it's probably going to be Death. I think Death. <laughs> I mean, in in all seriousness, <laughs> there is a high probability we don't see Jungle until the next five star. Which, mm-hmm. it, considering she has been such a linchpin for the promotion for you know the last couple of months, her storyline has sort of been permeating all of the shows as one of the main storylines. It's such a shame that we're not going to say... I mean, it's going to be weird not seeing Tokyo Cyber Squad in general and seeing Dark Konami, but it's just, yeah, it's full of nothing but sincere regret for her. We wish her the speediest of recoveries, and we're sure that Tag League is not going to be as good for not having Jungle Kiona in it. So, yeah, heart goes out to her. Um, Match five, then, just very quickly, uh, was a four-on-four elimination match with the Queen's Quest team of Sayaka Matani, Yutami Hayashita, Momo Watanabe, and Azumi, defeating Donna Del Mondo team of Juliet, Himika, Mika, and Natsupoi in 21 minutes and 6 seconds. couple of interesting things to come out of this. Uh, Mika eliminated Yutami, um, which was very, very interesting. Um, Saya Kamatani, who was the sole survivor winning the match for her team, eliminated Julia, which we can assume is going to set up some sort of challenge further on down the line. Um, and then Natsupoi eliminated Azumi. So again, setting up a challenge, presumably for the high speed championship further on down the line. So we're looking at new stories, Chris. Are you excited at the thought of Natsupoi and Azumi? Are you excited for the thought of Saya Kamatani versus Julia? Natsupoi versus Azumi does interest me. Just, I'm interested in what she can do outside of a tag setting or outside of a squash match setting. And again, she seems perfectly um, equipped for the high-speed championship, so that's amazing. Um, Saya versus Julia has filler defense written all the fuck over it. Yeah. But it was still going to be a good match. <laughs> I agree. If this was in six months' time, maybe, I would believe that there mm. is a very high probability that Sire is taking that belt from Julia. However, at the moment, I don't think Sire has been built enough to take the white belt off Julia. I think eventually she will. I think eventually there is a very high probability that she takes the belt off Julia if Julia is to hold it for a long period of time, which I think she will. Pardon me. Um, I mean, I was I was more of a fan of their five star match than you were, anyway. So I I think mm-hmm. they've got good chemistry, anyway. Especially if you've got you know arrogant dickhead Julia taking on a person she thinks is below her, and then Saya gets the surprise win. I think that can work. Um, but yeah, if if this happens in the next what six weeks, eight weeks, there's there's not a chance Saya takes that belt. <clears throat> yeah, it's probably if if it's gonna happen, it's probably gonna happen at the next Corican show because we tend to just have title matches interspersed with um, tag league. Or at least we there did is. Last year. There are two Corricans. Um, there's one on the 18th, which I'm gonna read the card out for very shortly. Um, that's on the 18th of October, and then there is one at the end of October, which I believe is the 29th. I think um, it's the 20 something at Corican, and there is actually a title defense already set from tag league um which is <laughs> is very interesting but i don't want to tell you if you don't know chris um it, it doesn't spoil um, I'm anything i'm not fussed about tag league spoilers um, yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not so, fussed about spoilers because i'm more curious now because especially since you went like that so i'm assuming it, it's death it's not is death, it death unfortunately um Aww. so the next white belt defense is actually julia versus himika 
Oh, oh, that from makes obviously sense. <laughs> him and Kadafina in the five star, which which does make perfect sense. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's probably going to be a way for Julia to get a win back, but also I wasn't massive on that match. Again, I think I was a little bit higher on it than you were. Um, it, it was a good mm-hmm. match. It was a very good match. And like I say, I think Himika's getting st- from match. strength yeah. to strength, isn't she? So I can see that match being a belter. Mm-hmm. It could, po- possibly. I, I think the tournament setting might have hindered it a bit. Yeah. We'll see. Um, so that was that show. We've more or less caught up now. Um, the Tag League... The Goddesses of Stardom Tag League then started on the 10th of October. As we said, Stardom are proper piling shows out at the moment. Um, So we've got two blocks, um, similar to the Five Star, obviously. Basically, it's their answer to World Tag League, but it's far better. Um, Two blocks, blue block and a red block. Um, The teams were announced and they are as follows. So the blue Goddess block is Dream H. Tam Nakano and Mina Shirakawa. Uh, Momo AZ, which is Momo Watanabe and Azumi. Grab the Top, which is Suri and Himika. Black Widows, which is Konami and B Priestley, and also receives the award for best team name. Um, Color Me Pop, which is Gokik and Death and Riho. Um, excuse me, that's for best. For fuck's sake. <laughs> um, we've then got the red goddess block, which is MK Sisters, which is Mayu Iwatani and Starlight Kid. <laughs> I'm sorry, but when you say MK, I just think of um, the counsellor from, Fa- from South Park. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to win, win tag league, MK. Okay? <laughs> um, uh, we've got Wing Gory, which is Saya Ida and Hanan otherwise known as Pin Eaters Are Us. Um, <laughs> Aphrodite, which is Utami and Saya Kamatani, who, are, of course, are the current uh, goddess of stardom tag champs. Uh, Crazy Bloom, which is Julia and Micah. Oh, I get it. I I get it, because Aphrodite is a goddess and never goddess. So I, that's very clever. But I see what they're doing there. All right there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just understood it so I'm just happy that okay, I understood cool. something um, so yeah Crazy Bloom which is Julia and Micah and then Devil Duo which is Natsuki Tora and Saki Kashima otherwise known as DQs are us um, now Chris obviously we are two, we are already two shows into the tag league um, now thankfully I have actually managed to avoid spoilers as far as that goes but um, so have I we have had some questions on the Discord, and the first one actually is in reference to this tag league. Uh, Velkish Bracker, who is on our Discord, has said, who's winning the tag league? Who, in your opinion, has the biggest chance to win and why? And if they win, are they taking the belts from the champs? So, of those teams that I've read out to you, Chris, who do you think is t- are going to win the tag league? I'm trying to remember who won last year to sort of gauge. Well, I don't know it was Tam and Arita who won mm, last year. Was it? So... I thought it was B and Jamie. One I'm second. sure it was B and Jamie last year because then they won the belts. That, um, tag league. I can't wait to hear the moment when Chris realizes I'm right. Right. Okay. I'm, I, it's okay if you're right. It, it happens occasionally. <laughs> Dick it. <laughs> <laughs> um combined I don't care about reigns. God damn it. Um hang on. This We're is the sort of thing you tune in for, isn't it, guys? Awkward silence while Chris Googles things. How can you still be looking at um... up? How? <laughs> Here we go. Start. Alright, I've got I I'm like, hang on, hang on. Um Day f- no, that's day oh, three. Oh, for God God's sake. God damn it. I, I, I hate. Okay, okay, okay. Have okay. you got it now? Um, yeah, I am just need to scroll down because there's a lot Jesus of matches. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I'm dance versus match. Okay, what the fuck? Aha! <laughs> I give up. <sighs> right. Who do you think is going to win this Wait, year then? Um, 
Who's feeding in DDM? Well, no one's feeding with DDM, right? Oh, it's not. Who's feeding with Queen? So it's not going to be a Queen's Quest team. Um, I rec- actually, rec- I reckon Konami and um, B. Yeah, Kana- Konami and B might actually be another chance since B is a perpetual tag wrestler nowadays. Um, they might also get it to Tam and Mia. yeah, just to get her some yeah. reps in. Um, also, I don't think we can di- discount you. Were say that, for fuck's sake. Um, <laughs> personally, I think grab the top are going to go the distance, which is Suri and Himika. Um. You look at blue block, uh, sorry, red block, and that's Mayu and Starlight. Well, they're not going to win it. Sai, Ida, and Hanan, they're not going to win it. They're not They're not going to have Utami and Saya win it again. You know, they're not going to have them win the tag league and then challenge themselves, are they? Um, which means it's between Julia and Micah or Natsukatora and Saki Kashima, which I don't think it will be the latter, which means Julia and Micah are going to make it through. I think it would be a really good dynamic if you have an all DDM final and Siori and Himika take it. Because not only does that give us a really interesting thing in DDM, I think it also builds to uh, some dissension, which will be interesting. I I, f- I found the tag league. Was I right? No. Was I not? <laughs> no, yeah, Rita and Tam In 2000, won. In 2019? No, they didn't. Yes, we I'm did. sure B and Jamie won in 2019. I, 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 I am sending you the link right now to be like. If I'm wrong, then cagematch.net is wrong. I'm sure it was B and Jamie. I, I remember watching it too. It was fun. It Fair was enough. Fun I apologize. I was convinced it was B and Jamie. <laughs> that always happens to me. Like in my head, I'm like, uh, it'd be like, oh, um, I'm sure Nakanishi was an intercontinental champion. It's like, no, of course he wasn't. You... Of course not. It's anyway, Nakanishi. Continuing on. Um, so I've gone for grab the top. You think Black Widows are going to go the distance? I yeah. think it would have been interesting if Black Widows were in the other block because I think that's a natural final. Siori and Himika versus Konami and B. Yeah. That is a natural final, actually. Yeah, it is, it, it is, but there we are. So there you go. That's uh, Those are our picks. We'll probably be hilariously wrong. Um, Niagara Driver, friend of the show. <laughs> yeah, we were, hilarious. we were hilariously wrong about the fucking We were stuff. hilarious fucking hell. I, I went from 5th to 21st in the Voices of Wrestling Pickums. <laughs> Fuck it, I'll do a podcast on the stardom, on the roster, on the entire fucking promotion and I fucked it up never mind anyway um, so Niagara Driver friend of the show hello Niagara Driver um, says "What? who do you think has got the biggest boost from the five star Grand Prix and Yokohama Cinderella um, we've spoken about the five star a bit Micah has got a massive boost coming out of that Himika has obviously got an enormous boost coming out of that um, Konami I think has got from the from both shows. It... Yeah, Konami from both shows is definitely. If we're talking like five star in a bubble, then it would definitely be Himika because she went from like no name finalist, to yeah, contender. absolutely. Yeah, so, um, but in terms of like both combined, Konami is like now on people's radar as someone who's mm. worth watching. Well, more than she was before, where like she was a bit no personality before, now she has a personality. Yeah, amazing, absolutely. Um, and also, she has she's a newly minted official heel. So. Yeah, and I think you know, just from the five star, she we spoke about it on pretty much every podcast we did during the five star that she was one of the most, if not the most, entertaining person wrestling that night. And then to put on top of that, that the fact that she's the sole reason that Tokyo Cyber Squad disbanded. She's now a heel with a weeder tie. She's got massive momentum going forward. And then, you know, depending on how well she does during the Goddesses of Stardom Tag League, you know, she might be challenging for the tag belts. I see her being a singles champion in the very, very near future because, you know, you need to capitalize on this sort of momentum for someone. You don't do this for them for them then just to fade off into the distance. Um, evil, <laughs> yeah. evil, fuck me. Jesus, his matches are hard work. Um, 
aside from that, I mean, you've got the obvious Azumi, I think, has done phenomenally well. But, you know, at the moment, mm-hmm. she is a high speed wrestler and a tag wrestler, nothing more. Um, I think, like you said, Chris, we will get there. Same with Starlight. But not yet. And someone I am going to mm-hmm. mention, um, probably not an enormous amount of a boost, but someone who has done themselves really quite proud over the last couple of months is um, Saya Kamatani. Um, Mm -hmm. Because she's gone from, you know, she went from having, finally having gear that matched with the rest of Queen's Quest in June. um, Because she she did feel like a bit of the odd one out. Um, And she's gone Mm -hmm. from June and that amazing tag match between all of Queen's Quest to then go on and become tag champ, to then go on and every single match in that five-star, she got better. She was able to tell more stories. Yes, I know the selling is still an issue, but in-ring-wise, she's getting better and better and better. And, you know, the shows that we've reviewed today, the Osaka one, the Corican, um, she was really, really good in them. She had a good match against B. She was really good in the tag match against Micah and Himika. I think she's actually had a very, very good couple of months. Do you agree, Chris? I, yeah, I think in terms of five star, the only people who came out of it either the worst for wear or the same are people like Tam Momo or Mayu who couldn't really get higher, or um, Saya who wasn't book strong, or Tora who was <laughs> who was Tora. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like apart from that, like. Everyone else, went, and I think that leaves um, like eleven other people. All came out of a five star, looking better than they went yeah, in. Absolutely, absolutely. Before we sign off, then um, the card for the next Corican show, which, as mentioned, was October the eighteenth, has been announced. And I just want to quickly run that through with you now. Now, when we um, when our next podcast drops, which at the moment, at the time of recording, will be October the eighteenth, obviously this show will not be up in its entirety, so we'll have to review that the following Sunday. Um, the show then um, starts off with Saeeda versus Tam Nakano in singles action. Uh, Mina Shirakawa against Himika in singles action. We've then got an eight-man tag. Uh, Juliet, Siori, Micah, and Natsupoi taking on B Priestley, Konami, Natsukatora, and Saki Kashima, which could be good, could be just a random DQ. So let's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like um, playing roulette with... Exactly. If Nats Couture's in the ring, it'll be a DQ. However, if Darth Konami's in there, we could get a decent uh, we could get a decent finish. Um, yeah, Darth it's good. Konami. I'm going to give her a different name every time I say it. Y- use the code <laughs> so we've got Konami. Dark Konami, Darth Konami, Shadow Konami. Konami. God, I'm cool. Um, Heart- Heartless Konami, Kingdom Hearts. Nice, reference. like it. Um, we've then got what looks like our sole tag league match of the Corican show, uh, which is Momo Z, Momo Watanabe, and Azumi taking on Aphrodite, Utami, and Saya. I am all for that, Chris. When I, when I hear Aphrodite, have you ever seen the Hercules TV show? I the haven't. Disney one? Aphrodite turns up, it's like Af- 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 Aphrodite, oh, God. the goddess of love, and it's amazing. <laughs> um, we got a trios match, which is Riho, Starlight, and Hanan taking on Goki, and Death, Hina, and Rina. Um, and then the main event, which is uh, for the World of Stardom Championship, Mei Watani versus Takumi Aurora. So, <laughs> yes. Yes. Got the Di- Daniel Bryan things are up, are they? Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, so an absolute belter, I imagine. Rematch of the, st- rematch of the start of the match of the yes, year. Yes, so. yeah. Um, I'm, again, I will check that out. Hopefully you've seen it. Hope- I was about to say, hopefully you've seen it by then because it's been about, it's been most of a year at this point. I will. I will. I'll have checked it out. A um, couple of matches confirmed on um, Saturday, October the 17th, which will be night three or day three, sorry, of the Tag League, which will be Devil Duo versus Momo AZ. Uh, Devil Duo, of course, Nats Katora and Saki Kashima. And then we've also got Crazy Bloom, which is Julia and Micah taking on Color Me Pop, which is Riho and Goki and Death. Um, so two absolute fucking <laughs> bangers there. Um, 
I still love that name. I still, I'm never going to not it love really that name. Really me. So, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking around with us um, on this nearly two and a half hour podcast. Uh, we've managed to whip through four shows and questions and look at the tag league in. A time that I think is actually quite decent. We thought it was going to be like a four-hour slog. Um, we've managed to condense it down. So thank you for waiting. Again, it was solely my fault that this has come out late. And um, it was solely my fault that Chris had to do the last podcast on his own. So thank you for bearing with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, please go subscribe, like, share the podcasts to anyone that listens to Stardom. We really do appreciate any sort of exposure. Anyone listening to the podcast, thank you so much for doing it. Um, any five-star reviews, any comments really do help the podcast out. You can go and check out www.podmania.co.uk. You can check out all our match ratings and archived podcast episodes there. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at, at the Stardom Cast. Um, you can follow me, on Twitter at, at real Rob Goodwin. Chris, where can they find you? At Death Yammer, Death Yammer Sand, which I don't even think is her Twitter handle, so fuck knows where that's going right, to send okay. them. I, can't, I, I, I had one, but then the podcast went almost three <laughs> hours, and I lost. Um, join us on Sunday the 18th, where we will be talking the first two nights, and maybe the main event, of night three of the goddesses of stardom tag league but in the meantime thank you so much for listening guys and we'll talk to you guys again soon 